Oliva, tranquilo? Good afternoon, Dr. Luiz Gonçalves. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Oliva. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Paulo. E aí, Paulo? Aceita o mate aí? Estraga. Acabei de tomar meu cafezinho aqui. Cada um com suas drogas, Luiz. Oi? Cada um com suas drogas. Como é que... Eu já tomei muito chimarrão. Eu morei em Mato Grosso do Sul. Aí lá a gente tomava todo dia de manhã, era chimarrão. E tereré também tomava lá. Vocês não tomam tereré, é só chimarrão aí, né? Aqui faz muito só frio. Quente. Aqui... É. Mas lá era... Pô, mas aí no verão é 40 graus. 40 graus tem que ser tereré. Não dá para tomar chimarrão no, no verão, estamos... né? Nós estamos aqui em novembro e a temperatura aqui eu acho que está uns 17, 16 graus. Está friozinho? Tá? <risos> Viu no final a reunião de família? Não, <risos> eu vi que entrou tua mulher ali e tudo mais, o pessoal todo. Tá? <risos> é. Por falar nisso, Luiz, tu comentou, morou, agora de, tu comentou do Mato Grosso. Eu estou ouvindo a minha voz. Eu acho que é contigo que eu estou ouvindo a minha voz, Luiz. Está dando um retorno aí. Bom, o... tu comentou agora do Mato Grosso. Tua mãe de viva, Luiz? Tua mãe que morava lá no Mato Grosso. Está no mudo. Ah, pronto. Minha mãe está aqui do meu lado. Mande um mãe abraço para ela. ela... Ela não deve lembrar de mim, mas eu lembro mim. dela. <risos> Olha que se eu chamar ela lá, ela vai lembrar de você, viu? Eita! O dia... eu, eu fui o eu sujeito que lá. dormi na cozinha dela. Oi! <risos> Orivaldo, em 2000... Putz, agora já não sei, cara. Acho que 2005. Eu era aluno de graduação... E, e teve um evento desse de robótica lá no Mato Grosso do Sul. E nós aqui do Sul não tínhamos de ficar e o Luiz Marcos arrumou para nós ficar na casa da mãe dele. Ah, que legal. E tinham quantas pessoas com ele, assim, que foram para a casa dele? Para a casa da mãe dele, acho que foram era umas sete pessoas, sete ah, alunos é, de graduação. Que legal. Nós era três do Sul e três do Norte, três do Rio Grande do Norte. Três do Rio Grande do Sul e, três do Rio Grande... e quatro do Rio Grande do Norte. <risos> E a mãe dele teve que sair, porque era muita gente. A mãe dele liberou a casa para a gente. Tem que meninos com a casa. Que legal. Muito bom. Mas, mas já faz aí mais de 15 anos, Orival. É. Então... Senta aí. Deixa eu dar essa desse menino aí. Senta aí, mãe. Senta aqui. Oi. Oi, Oi tudo bom? Tudo bom? Como é que tá, senhora? Eu, eu fiquei na sua casa, lá em Campo Grande. Você tá sem som. Ah, tá aqui saindo aqui. Diga aí, Paulo, eu tava sem o um som. Eu, eu fiquei na sua casa lá em Campo Grande há uns 20 anos atrás. Você ficou na minha casa em Campo Grande 20 anos atrás? Sim. A senhora nos Mas emprestou a sua eu... casa. Mas tá é você. Eu tô, eu tô mais velho. Meu Deus. Ai, como você tá mudado. Você se formou? Faz tempo já, né? É. Já é professor. Você tava já. fazendo direito, né? Então, estamos todo mundo aqui agora estudando. Sempre estudando. Você tá morando aonde? Lá no Rio Grande do Sul. Você está no Rio Grande do Sul agora? Isso, passando frio e tomando chimarrão. Isso que eu estou vendo aí. <risos> Mas eu lembro de você, olha, parabéns, viu? E eu agradeço tanto você ter feito aquilo por mim. Você, tua esposa. E tua esposa, como é que está? Tudo bem, obrigado. Quem é que ela? Aqueles meninos que foram lá, que ficaram na casa da senhora. Ah, eu lembro, eu lembro, eu lembro, lembro. Eu lembro que você ficou lá em casa, assim, a turminha. Era um bando de menino. 
É, eu fui lá para casa da, da minha mãe e deixei vocês lá sozinho. Se Isso. Pois é. A gente correu a senhora. Tchau. Não correu nada, menino. Eu estava mesmo lá na casa da minha filha cuidando dela. Pensei que era muito de lá quando eu... Ela confundiu você com o outro. Agora é. que ela lembrou, quando você falou no final aí da, dos meninos que ficaram lá, ah, agora eu lembro. É. Tá faz lembro, bastante agora. tempo, né, Luiz? Eu já não lembro mais, imagina sua mãe. Oi? Tá todo mundo aqui? Da... Eu, eu, eu já não lembro mais, imagina sua mãe. Bom, fez, vamos lá, já ela fez 80 horas, anos agora. Vai, por isso que eu falei com ela para dar. Tá todo mundo aqui na sessão? Tem Alex, tem Kelly, João... A gente fica aqui no background, Orivaldo. Qualquer coisa que tu precisar, aí tu nos grita aí. A gente fica aqui Ótimo. só. Aquela está aquela falando comigo, Oliva. Ela já entra. Ótimo. Então, o Alex está aqui, né? Quando é que está liberado? Como é que funciona? O Bruno é que é o responsável aí por liberar. Bruno, deu ok, aí, que aí? Opa, uh, geralmente quem faz o trabalho é o Luiz Marcos. Eu posso fazer, Luiz? O que você acha? Não, não tem que liberar, não. Os, os chairs são livres aí para seguir. A gente só fica de sacanagem enquanto não começa, a gente faz o show, né? Chega queimando. Vai lá. Vamos embora lá. É... Hello, everyone. É, good afternoon. I am Arivaldo, and uh, I am guiding this session, the math session. We have four presentations in this section. Each presentation has a maximum of 15 minutes, including question times. Uh, the first presentation is Alex Souza with the thematic distributed MAS with Lidlar's consensus to job scheduling and virtual smart factor with modular conveyors. Alex, you listen to us. You are ready. Alex, are you here? Hi, uh, Alex contacted us with uh, by email um, some while ago. I believe either his trying to access our Zoom session, or um, he's having problem trying to access uh, our link. So um, if you can, please, um, you could um, ask the next participant. Okay. 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 So uh, we will wait to Alex get in the section and let's go on. Uh, this The second one is the Shortest path method for automated warehouse application with Kellen. Kellen with us. Kellen was also talking to me right now. I think I think she is closer to enter the session. Uh, I just sent her uh, uh, the password to the session. She I think she's, she's here. She's here. here. Oh, great. She's all right. Right. That, that's right. okay. You you ready? Ready, Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have 15 minutes uh, uh, for all time, and in, in, uh, I will uh, send messages to you when close to finish. So you can start. Feel free to, pre to present. Kelly, you needed some help? No. Ah, okay. So 
Bruno, you can uh, put the presentation of Kevin. Hi, Kelly. Uh, are you going to present your work or uh, are you playing your video or do you need us to play your video? I go uh, share my my screen because I Great. your presentation again. No, I no use the video. Okay. Okay, Kelly. Right. Okay. Great. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, we can see the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. I am Kelly Teixeira Vivaldini. I am a member of the LARI, Laboratory of Autonomous Robots and Intelligent City at the Federal University of São Carlo. And in this search, she was developing partly with the University of São Paulo, both in São Carlo, Brazil. And uh, I will talk about the short path method for automation warehouse application. And this part of the research, the professor Marcelo Becker uh, present in this session two. Okay, I will begin with a brief introduction and continue with the related works the methods of the minimum path problem, the proposed pro method, the result and analysis, and finally the conclusion of future words. Well, uh, material handling is an essential activity in the, any industrial production process, and its efficiency has a big impact on production costs. The automation of logistics system is essential for improving productivity. Often, automated logistics systems, such as, for example, industrial warehouse and container terminals, use AGVs, eh, autonomous guided vehicles, to optimize the cargo handling system. Uh, AGVs provide the uh, leap in quality and productivity in the logistics segment, offering significant advantages when compared to the company conventional materials loading equipment. In material hand activities, find the best route for the vehicles is a key factor for the improvement of the productive and efficiency and reduction of cost too. The short path is the most common criteria adopted in the route problem. And one of the main questions in the vehicle route problem is how can the travel distance be minimized? Yeah. For this, the short path methods are adopted. The difficulty in solving this problem is due to a large number of the non-optimal solutions. The best path is not always found in the quantity of the maneuvers no, is not taken into account in the route. Some researchers propose solutions to find the short path using the network simplest method. In several studies, the routing procedure described use diagnostic and short path algorithm to generate a matrix that describes the path occupation time of the vehicles. However, as previously mentioned, the short path is not always the most efficient method. The difficulty in solving the, path, the short path problem is due to a large number of no, no optimal solutions. Rosita, in 2019, presented an optimal route distribution by a set of parameters, combining multiple criteria decision-making, memorization, and dialysis algorithm. Guy Bidamoz proposed a modified dialysis algorithm for found alternative 
routes in situation where the cost of the generation short path are very huge. They extend that against of the application of the classical text algorithm. Er Dwarf. He, we can observe that different routes algorithms may generate routes with different numbers of maneuvers. A total of them have the same cost. We can select a route that has no minimal quantity of the maneuvers. The, the EGVs will do of this perform severe unnecessary acceleration and disacceleration maneuver to complete the route. Now, the best uh, path is no way found in the quantity of the maneuvers is no taking account in the route. Then this research proposed a modified version dice algorithm that eliminates the unnecessary maneuvers of vehicles and increase the time spent to perform this task. Network problems can be modeled uh, linear problem problems that require interior solution. If you determine the short path distance and maintain a feasible span tree structure and each interaction, successfully so transforming it in the improved span tree structure into it becomes optimal. It ends at the determination of the short path from a given source node S for all other nodes in a network. In other words, the problem consists of sending a unit of flow from the source to every other node along of the minimum cost path. Next algorithm search for the source path between any two nodes of a network when all arcs have a non negative cost. It uses an interactive procedure that establishes the closed node to the source node in the first interaction. In the second interaction, the subsequent closed node is obtained, and so on until n nodes have been uh, reached. And proposed method the, and definitions is proposed method then this. Our house layout was used for the description of the method. Each vehicle leaves its stations, node S and T represent the uh, X and enter nodes for the default, which is also single, therefore S and T are coincident. Considering the set of the routes and the set of the intermediary position, the network used to the model the environment can be defined as a set of nodes and a set of the rented arcs. For a set of the routes, each route I is specified as a part of the position, origin and the task destination, a cost value, a duration, and the time intervals. And the routine output is defined as a sequence of the route performed by a number of the, car, the key vehicles, where each route key is the sequence of intermediate position each vehicle must occur Achieve to the complete in this task. From these definitions, external routes with schedule constraint are considered solution to the routine problem. The following mathematical formulation show the functions considering the optimization problem formulation applied to vehicle routine. The equations introduce our proposed formulation to minimize the number of the necessary maneuvers. The, in question six, the objective function consider the vehicle's travel cost sum from the origin node to the destination node for our questions. The number of the maneuvers can necessary for the vehicle to complete its task is taken into account and the weight is attributed to each maneuver executed. The maneuvers are analyzed according to the X and Y coordination of each point. The equation seven and eight ensure the task are assigned to only on the equal. The constraint seven show that start from node J, the vehicle will arrive only as node I. And the constraint eight establish the vehicles that arrive at node I will have to leave for a single node J. And in equation 14, uh, equation 14, sorry, is using 
the the variable of the maneuvers for consideration and minimize the unnecessary maneuvers. Well, and some tests are executing. In this test, it was a, used a simple graph with only eight nodes whose origin and destination were node zero and node seven, respectively, for the task. The figure represented the nodes of time for Dijkstra and Network Simplex algorithm. This show a similar between the results where the algorithms found the same minimum path, five nodes and cost, cost 25 meters. And the test to run uh, analysis indicating Dijkstra algorithms less percent time than the simplex algorithm. The standard deviation of nine considered the average cons consumption as to the simple algorithms and T and 31.8 and the extra algorithm uh, time is 15.63. The analysis of the performance of the algorithm is difficult in the various simple environment, as both can produce a similar routes. Um, test two, the route to one, can be seen in this figure. In different paths for the desired destination. However, in both cases, the algorithms found routes with the six nodes, two curves, and a total cost of the 22 meters. The average consumption of the simplex algorithm is harsher than the algorithm. For route two, in this figure, the algorithms found different path with no uh, nine nodes and a cost of 29 meters. The path calculated by the Dijkstra algorithm has two curves and the network simplex three curves. In, in route three, both the algorithms found a path with seven nodes and a cost of 23 meters. However, Dijkstra algorithm had one curve, whereas the short path simplex algorithm has two curves on the path. The route four, uh, show different paths for the desired destination, but, but uh, both algorithms found a route with seven nodes and a cost of the 27 meters. And both have two curves. Reckon, uh, regarding the process and time performance, the algorithms achieve a similar result. And the difference in the average consummation was only 0 0.048 meters milliseconds. The data analysis show both algorithms produce path of the similar cost, although they show uh, different numbers of the maneuvers. And all tests, independently of the environment, DAX algorithm provide a better process time and do, do the algorithm complexity. In test three, uh, according to the paths obtained, we can observe that the number of the maneuver of vehicles can be minimized in most of path. Therefore, we have developed an optimization props to eliminate the necessary maneuvers uh, uh, and found the optimal solution. So, our proposed optimization process can be applied to both algorithms. We decided to use DICE algorithm for two main reasons. In comparison to network simplex algorithm, it is faster. And as the network simplex search process verify all network nodes, ever and ever, you'd produce a new search, which would increase the process time. Thus, two tests were performed to validate the method, test three, uh, using a graph with uh, 31 nodes and uh, 360 nodes. The, this figure show the best path obtained by modified diagnosis, this in purple. The, in the test three, the route one requires the process time. The statistical analysis also indicates that the modified diagnosis algorithm, the time in 25. 
uh, more uh, time consuming compared of the digester algorithm, but it shows a difference of the 0 0.315 uh, milliseconds. Uh, and and seven and eighty point three hundred and seven three milliseconds in compared to network simplex. This is a result. In Wurtsche two, the um, big environment and the vehicle is starting the port and deliver the pallet on the shelf. And here, and here, root 2 and root 3. The, in, in comparison to the network simplex algorithm, the modified DAX algorithm found, again, a better path in relation to the number of the maneuvers to perform, and one instead of three. In test 3, root 3, the vehicle start in, uh, in the charge platform and deliver a uh, pallet on the shelf. Here, the charge platform on the shelf. And the modified DAX algorithm found a better path in relation to the number of the maneuver to stand up the four for the other two algorithms. But all algorithms provide the same result regarding the root cost, the cost. Né? Regarding the root cost, algorithms are okay, okay, the same result on both routes. However, the modified DAX algorithm consume less processing time than the network simplex algorithm on both routes. You can send the B in the table. Um, as conclusion, your main focus was on the path calculated by algorithms and then their number of the maneuvers. Our modified DAX algorithm could produce better results in comparison with uh, Dijkstra and network simplex algorithm with the similar processing time ranges. Moreover, the number of the vehicle maneuvers can be reduced with a minimal impact of the total process time. In a real application, this reduction would case a decrease in vehicle maintenance costs and the time required for other fulfillment. Other future modifications in the vehicle route algorithm, such as the speed and acceleration variation, can this also reduce the other fulfillment time? There's um, um, the reference using the new work. And thank you. Congratulations, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have about one minute for questions. Does anyone have any questions? So let me see. No question in YouTube, no question from YouTube. Uh, I have a question. Have a... Good. So feel free uh, to ask. Congratulations, Kelly, on, on your work. Um, I just want to, um, it would be very interesting to know if um, somehow COVID-19 pandemic um, affected your results. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, people, my son is here. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Uh, I just At the moment uh, of the question. <laughs> no. no problem at all. Uh, my mom, my mom was here some minutes ago too. That's <laughs> uh, very nice. Uh, so Kelly, I, I asked you um, if somehow the COVID-19 pandemic affected your results or your experiments. Thanks. Um, and this, this research is about my doctorate. Then this no affect directly because in the moment, I no use this this experiment 
Because I use the... Gente, desculpa, meu filho está aqui me bem na. There's no problem. Uh, uh, it, it, it was just this, this I was curious about. So uh, you use it, uh, some data you already had, I believe. Um, you did have to go to the physical warehouses to um, put the robots to to operate and get get back the results, I believe. Um, you have you already had this data. Uh, sorry, uh, Bruno. Uh, it is very bad the the this this song for me. Do you write the question in the chat, please? Yes, yes, I can write. Yes, yeah. no problem. Thank you. Arvaldo, uh, you you can ask you can you can ask for another questions and uh, if we don't have any other questions you can call the next presenter and then we continue the discussion with Kellen here on the chat or on our Discord server. Okay. Good. I think he, I, 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 we need to go on because he, uh, the timing uh, is best. We not we don't have we have few time for the next presentation. So uh, I think Bruno will talk with Kelly in the chat and we go on. Okay. Uh, let's Thank go. you. Thank My you very much, Kelly. Uh, camera off because they connect you, okay? Okay, let's go. Next one is, um, let's get here. Uh, Alex Souza. Alex, you listen me? You are listening? Alex. I think he is not here. Not here. Uh, Orivaldo. So I believe he is not in panelist, not nor attendees. I think you can move ahead. Okay. To the next Thank one. Thank you, Professor. Professor. Uh, the next one is João Carlos. João Carlos. Good afternoon. Are you hearing me? Oh, yeah. oh good. Very good. I'm listening to you. Uh, you are ready to presentation? Yes, and I will share my video here. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, and you can go on and have a nice presentation. Thank you. Just uh, say to me if you can hear the video, okay? I can see you, you, your screen. Okay. No sound. Okay. No sound? No sound in here, at least. If you prefer, I think Bruno can play your video. Okay, uh, can you can you please play the video? Okay, Bruno, you are listening. Yes, I am. Um, I'm, I'm having some problems playing the video, so I ask uh, Emerson. Emerson, uh, could, could you please uh, play play the video of this presentation, please? Good afternoon. My name is João Carlos and I'll be presenting this work about autonomous navigation system for open to robot based on map forms. The main motivation of this work is the improvements the automation can bring to construction operations, especially wall painting, such as reduction of production costs and total work time, optimization of material usage, and more quality control. Wall painting has a great potential for automation, 
but is in operation and needs the adaptability of autonomous mobile robots. There are several proposals of mobile robots and methods for wall painting in the literature. For instance, in the paper Autonomous Wall Painting Robots, the authors present a simple system for wall following that uses an erase to, to keep fi a fixed distance to the walls according to ultrasound sensor readings. The main advantage of this work is the simple implementation. However, it only works in, complex, in convex closed maps. This other work uses an approach based on dynamic virtual walls to perform wall following. Despite being able to work in more complex environments, it does not work with open maps. So our objective is to develop an autonomous navigation system for wall painting that is able to work in open, convex, and non-convex maps and to avoid following edges of unexpected obstacles. This is the flow chart of our proposal system. We have two main assumptions. The robot has a no map a priori, and the walls of the map are perpendicular. We use the wheelodometry and laser scans and propose a good generator algorithm to feed the ROS navigation stack. The ROS navigation stack is a robust navigation system that receives as inputs odometry, range measurements, the initial pose of the robot, and the desired goal, and outputs velocity commands to the mobile base. It uses the Monte Carlo algorithm to localize the robot in the map, using as input the given initial pose and the sensor information. The output is the estimated pose of the robot. We can see in the picture the red arrows that represent the weighted pose estimations. We propose a goal generator algorithm that receives the map of the environment as input and send goals to the ROS navigation stack. It, have several, it has several steps, such as map erosion, coordinate detection, and sort goals. The first step is to create an offset of the walls in the map in order to create a distance between the robot path and the walls. This is done with the erosion operation. The Harris coordinate detector is used to identify the corners in the image that will, that will be the reference points used as a goal in the ROS navigation stack. Due to the presence of redundant detections, we implemented a filter to remove the, the, redundant, the, the redundant points based on the Euclidean distance. Initially, the order of the detected corners are random, as shown in the red number of the picture. We implemented a modified version of the gradient scan algorithm to correctly sort the goals. So finally, we have the goal generator algorithm. It combines the techniques of Harris coordinate detection and map erosion to find an offset of the map corners in order to generate goal coordinates that will be sent to the ROS navigation stack. The goals are sorted in a counterclockwise manner using the modifier gradient scan and their coordinates are converted to pixel values to meters. After this pre-processing steps, the robot navigates to each goal, maintaining its orientation towards the walls until it passes along every edge of the map. In order to decide the next orientation, the system uses the coordinates of the current pose of the robot, the previous and the next goal to analyze if the current corner is open or closed. Depending on the case, the robot decides if it should turn 90 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise. We performed our simulations in the gazebo environment using two different maps, a rectangular convex map and a non-convex map, both open. In the picture of the right is the mechanical robot using the simulations. It has wheel encoders and a laser scanner. Here we have a video of the simulation. So you can see that the robot uh, is always facing the wall every time. And then returns to the initial point. So these images show the trajectories of the robot starting from four different points in the map. 
and you can see that it always uh, can correctly perform the trajectory. In the next test, the robot travels in a non-convex map. The left figure shows the robot going to the first goal, and the second figure shows the robot going to the fifth goal. And you can see that the next goal is always at the red point, and the green points are the other goals detected. So here is the, 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 the full trajectory. And here is a video of this test. And finally, the robot goes to the initial point. The robot is constantly checking if there is an unexpected obstacle in the path using ladder information. If it encounters an unexpected obstacle, it stops and waits for the object removal. So in the figure at the left, you can see the robot uh, stopping and due to the presence of uh, an obstacle, in the right, we can see this obstacle in the gazebo environment. So, uh, some details about implementation. This work was implemented in C++ as a ROS package. It uses OpenCV library for the computer vision tasks. And it was the simulations were performed in the standard notebook. Table 1 shows the numerical results in both maps. The execution time corresponds to the time during motion and the processing time is the time to generate the goals. The robot achieved an average speed of about 18 centimeters per second on the rectangular map, and about 11 centimeters per second on the L-shaped map, both feasible results. The robot took longer on the L-shaped map due to the high number of edges, as the maximum rotational velocity of the robot was set lower than the maximum translational velocity. To conclude, we presented an effective autonomous navigation system for raw painting robots and tested our system in open, convex, and non-convex maps, accomplishing the task in a feasible time in every tested scenario. However, the system has some drawbacks that needed for further improvements, for instance, the need for perpendicular walls. For future work, we aim to expand the methodology to maps without perpendicular edges and improve the obstacle detection module to allow the robot to continue the process after the obstacle is removed. Furthermore, we intend to test our methodology in a real mechanical wheel robot equipped with wheel odometry and laser scans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good presentation. Uh, uh, someone have a question? Does anyone have a question? I do have a question. Good. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, so uh, congratulations on your work, uh, Jean. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know uh, what do you believe it's going is going to be uh, the, um, the most difficult, um, I mean, uh, obstacles when you when you go to the real, when you're going to apply your algorithm in your in a real robot, what do you believe is going to be the main obstacles to, to tackle? Thank you. Oh, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, we need to assure that the robots, the, the control of the robots good. So a um, mechanical wheeled robot has a lot of slippage in the wheels and uh, it's difficult to control. So we have to, to perform a good control of the robot. And also, if the room uh, has the, the walls not too perpendicular, it can be difficult for the hair scoring detector to, to detect the edges. But I think the control is, it will be the most difficult part. Good, very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for 
for the explanations. Uh, we have the 20 minutes to finish, so uh, I will go on. So thank you again. The, the next one uh, is the uh, open design warehouse mobile robots. Uh, have someone to present this report? Orivaldo? Bruno? Uh, I don't believe there's, um, there's no author of this work right now, but uh, Alex de Souza, the first presenter of the session, and just join us. I, I think um, you may ask him if, um, if he's ready to present. Good, very good. Uh, Alex, you are listening to us? Yes. Okay, yeah. listen. You, you are ready to present? So if you if you uh, if you have your presentation, you can go on. Or or if you want to play the the, the video. Um, I will show the presentation. Great. So feel free to present. Um, and have a nice presentation. This is your research with the authors Alex Luiz de Souza, is me, and uh, André Schneider de Oliveira. We propose a distributed multi-agent system, which interacts with virtual elements of a smart factory, conveyors, robot, and the stations, developing behaviors to control modular conveyor and production. Thus, uh, literally consensus machinism distributed was designed, which helps agents execute production schedules of different productions uh, simultaneously. Uh, the system can also pre-adjust the parts transport road so that they pass through specific machines in a particular order. Uh, the structure of a virtual smart factory, as seen in the figure, is composed of eight modular conveyors, nine manufacturing stations, uh, and the one robotic arm. Five stations are in the linear cell, and four stations in a circular cell. The conveyors and the robotic army interconnect the cells and distribute the station parts. Uh, there is an AGV, but is hot, uh, has not been explored in the proposed system. Uh, the scheduler is an independent ROS node, as are conveyors, robots, and stations. Scheduler operations. First, uh, the scheduler creates a production model based on sequence of devices using the manufacture of each part. Second, uh, the scheduler process the model with the job shop algorithm, which generates a production schedule. The schedule is composed of a set of events which are tasks or process to be performed. This is formatted in ascending order of time and 
events are associated with sequence tokens. Finally, uh, the schedule is sent by the communication network using ROS messages to the system schedules. Uh, the schedules consist of a set of events that represent tasks or process, and each has the following eight routes. Uh, start uh, task start time, uh, duration of task, uh, ID of the agent that control the event, task, product ID or package or part, and the uh, token, which is a sequence for events. Uh, this figure illustri illustrates an agent, uh, agent's architecture, which is divided in two parts. Uh, in the control part, each agent is associated with a system resource, a conveyor, or uh, a station, for example and can directly control the resource. And in communication part, the agent has support for hosts and use three common topics for uh, exchange messages with the other agents. This is the basis of leaderless consensus. Uh, with the topics of broadcast, uh, to receive events from the scheduler, signaling uh, for the agent to inform me that it is executing a particular event, and synchronize to calculate the current token. For each station, a transition matrix is used to calculate a package route between stations incorporated in the scheduler programming and represents the sequence of devices as a path for packages or products uh, on the production line. In the matrix, the cell with a value of zero represents the stations, stations position, the, in the initial location, que ela é de key is zero, and the remaining cells are incremented by one for each cell of key zero distance. Mm. In this example, there are two matrices, A and B, uh, uh, the calculation of the resulting matrix P is simple. Just here, the DH cell of A to respective cell of B, and the lowest cost value, say in this case, represent the road between two stations, represent uh, the path, which is a sequence of numbers corresponding to the position of each cell, with cost six. Uh, in the resulting matrix. Remember that each cell in the matrix represent a plant resource, conveyor station or robot. Uh, the se sequence of machines and the paths between them cons constitute what we call a model used for the scheduler to organize the production schedule. The model contains uh, the resources IDs and the part processing time for each future. Uh, then uh, the job shop algorithm process the model generating a production schedule Schedule events are sorted in ascending order of time and receive sequence numbers 
que ela é de tokens. É... Some events have the same token number, uh, which means that they are events run, uh, running parallel at the same time, but by different resources, different stations or conveyors. Uh, the scheduler also generates a Gantt chart with the production schedule, where the flow of each product is observed in uh, different colors. Uh, now I will, I will present a short video of the system development. Okay, uh, with the scheduler on the left, I load the uh, production schedule file. Then I run the job shop algorithm and send the schedule to the, to the agents in the virtual environment on the right. Uh, it's, possi it's possible to view uh, the schedule created by the algorithm and the Gantt chart of the schedule. Each color in the Gantt chart represents a part of the same color in a, vir a virtual environment. Uh, the evolution of the system happens with the increase of the token. The agents that have the token of the moment perform their tasks. The token is only incremented when all agents running the current token are finished. Each agent has a buffer that stores its events filtered by the agent ID and agent signals uh, the orders when the token number of the moment corresponds to token of an event in in the queue of its buffer. For this, each agent also maintains a memory variable, which is increased when the agent signal uh, that they have tasks and they decrease when, uh, when they are finished. And this other part of the video show the system codes, each type of Agent has a class containing the functions and the code is executed in independent threads to follow the principle of a distributed multi-agent system. This is the code of a conveyor. It has functions for the control part broadcast receive the events and functions for consensus, such as signaling the execution of tasks and the synchronize for the control of the token. Alex, uh, sorry for, for interruption. You have one minute. Okay. Repeat. Uh, sorry for inter interruption. You have one minute to finish. More one minute, okay? So you, you can go on, but you, you have a few, uh, one minute to do the finish because uh, you have so many, so I have a few time to finish. Sorry, my, my English is not good and uh, I don't understand very well. Uh, Se tu conseguir avançar, a gente está com um tempo curto. Certo. E, uh, Se tu conseguir avançar, mais um minuto ou dois para concluir, ok? Ok, então eu vou concluir aqui.
Você deseja dar as considerações finais? Isso. Ótimo. Great. Uh, in the conclusion, we have to the proposed system has the ability to adjust the transport route of parts to pass through the stations in the specific order. Uh, the job shop algorithm combined with multi-agent concepts allow the execution of product with different processing orders. Consensus is dis distributed. Each agent is independent and collaborates with the group with all the with all the need for a leader uh, the test with the system were carried out in a virtual environment for this uh, virtual smart factory was devo developing with a linear cell and a circular cell connected by a modular conveyors and a robotic army and finally uh, the results were satisfactory for us but we we know that there is still a lot of work ahead mainly to reduce latency in the system avoid deadlocks and improve flexibility thank you thank you thank you so much alex uh, very very interesting uh, work uh, we have uh, the the time to, I have a few time to finish the section and we have more one work. Uh, so I will go on without question. But if uh, someone have a short question, we can uh, talk fast. Does someone, does anyone have a question? So let's go, go on. Uh, muito obrigado, Alex. Parabéns pelo trabalho. E, uh, the, the next one uh, we, is on video. The, 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 the author of the, the work, this work is on the competition and, and those uh, send messages to, to play the video. Bruno, you can play the video. Emerson, uh, could you please um, start the video playback for us? All right. Thank you. The, the video is, uh, the presentation oh. is an open designing warehouse right. mobile robot. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Thiago Nascimento. I'm a professor at the uh, Universidade Federal do Paraíba and I belong also to the Laboratory System of Systems Engineering and Robotics, LASER. This, I'm here to present this work called An Open Design Warehouse Mobile Robot. This work was, is performed by my, both my master students, João Neto and Ryan Barros, and by another grad student called Jorge Silva Filho. The idea of this work is to present a starting step to, on the design of a mobile robot applied to warehouses. But the idea is that despite this kind of robots already exists, we want to present a national technology-based mobile robot applied to these systems. So here we provide a possible mechanical, electrical and computational configuration that is based on national technology, which means that most of the parts of the robot, to build the robot, you can buy in national market. And as well, we present the, a ROS-based environment for both the robot and the warehouse. The version of the ROS we use is a, is a ROS Melodic, uh, usually installed in a Ubuntu 18, and is quite straightforward to, to simulate the, the robot movement. 
As I said, most of the material can be bought in national market, which makes the robot cheaper to be uh, construed. This kind of system, this mobile robots for warehouses, is called uh, robot mobile fulfillment, fulfillment centers. Well, as though mobile robotics is a vast uh, field of research, the first branch of mobile robotics to be applied directly in industry was RF, RMFS. So, uh, fulfillment centers using robot, mobile robotics uh, is a concept that's similar to AGVs, but instead of having one robot going around the, the unstructured uh, factory environment, we focus mainly on the multi-agent system applications. So here we have a picture with a shelf and the shelf carries goods and the robot carries the shelf. There is not shelves with robots going around the shelves and transporting goods. The goods are transported on the shelves they stayed. So you have several shelves and you have several robots and you have several pickup and delivery stations. The main difference between AGVs AC, AGCs, which is Automated Guide Cart, and Autonomous Mobile Robots uh, is this. Usually, the, two, the first two are uh, rigid present rules. You have like either a uh, guideline or a, a predefined uh, route that must be executed. Uh, Fixed infrastructure is a really well-structured environment, uh, requirements that you must attend in infrastructure, you must transport products, but with this, this, the, the product transportation is something that's common on the three cases. Uh, the picking process assistance is also common in the three, three, three cases, but autonomous mobile robots for fulfillment centers usually uh, do a sortation assistance, redeploy, it's redeployable, you can uh, take off and put it inside as well, intelligent and it's modular. Here we have three examples, this one probably everybody knows is a Kiva system which now it's called uh, Amazon Robotics, it's an Amazon robot for the Amazon uh, industry. But this one is a company that's owned by the Alibaba Group. And the Alibaba Group, together with other groups, created this company called Kainiao Logistics. The Kainiao Logistics, what they did was to buy several robots from Geek Plus, that's the, another Chinese company that uh, works with this kind of robots, and created this company company reverse engineer and put it uh, into application of their own needs of logistics so that's why they look similar but they are different so we have here three companies on this field Amazon Robotics, Kainia Logistics and Geek Plus Robotics so our design this is actually the first draft but uh, of the mechanical system but uh, since then we already did some modifications, especially on the lifting system, is that uh, usually these robots, they have two main wheels and two caster wheels on the front and on the rear. Instead of, instead of doing that, we use two main, we main wheels and we use four omnidirectional wheels so they can give the support but they are also free so we have only two robots with a differential traction and we have also a lift system that's composed by a motor uh, two uh, infinite screw screws that lift lift the system this design didn't have the compensation of uh, change on direction which means that when the robot turns the shelf turns with the robot. Our uh, current work, there is a mechanism that sees the rotation of the robot 
and compensates. Uh, so when the robot turns, the shelf remains uh, uh, fixed. So this system, this, this first preliminary system, can lift up to 150 kilograms and the robot, the robot only has uh, 0.5 by 0.5 meters of size, so it's kind of small. All the materials, as I said, can be found in Brazilian market. And the lift system was based on a power screw, uh, which is capable of maintaining a momentum without the help of an actuator, so you can lift the shelf and this will not present an effort on the motor and on the battery, on the power consumption itself. Uh, to avoid instability, we improve the shiftness of the lift plate, uh, which is lifted by two power screws. Actually, in the new version, we put three power screws, which spinning with a synchronous manner uh, in the same direction. The lifting mechanism uses also a pair of bevel gears uh, with the three uh, power screws, we use actually three bevel gears to convert the horizontal power to, from the DC motor to the lifting uh, vertical to torque that is needed to lift the shelf. Um, also, a, con a conical pair produces a reduction of 3 to 1 uh, with the out gear rigidly fixed in the axis that transmit the rotation. So, in the end, the total reduction is 6 to 1, giving the system, uh, giving the system a more uh, stiffness than a belt drive would give, for example. This uh, can be proved by the following calculations. For example, the lifting system, imagine that we have a motor with 100 watts and 3000 RPM, uh, then with the calculations we will have a torque of uh, 0 0.32 nanometers and the radius of the pinion then must be uh, through this, this calculation where T is the torque which means for example 0 0.2 nanometers M is the maximum mass lifted or the payload to be lifted in this case 150 kilograms and g is the gravity and then we have for example a radius of 0 0.0013 meters or uh, less than uh, around one millimeter well besides that in addition uh, with the steel screw and bronze note Considering also an average friction of 0.19, we choose a nominal diameter of 10 millimeters and a, pitch, a thread pitch of 1.5 millimeters and use this formula to calculate the, the torque that will be needed to lift 150 kilograms. So I have uh, the mass, the gravity, the nominal diameter, the pitch, uh, the friction factor, and with these values, I, I have uh, 1.7 nanometers torque on the screw. This is the torque on the screw, each, each one of the two screws. Well. Be, this is before reduction, so you mean that uh, if this torque is six times less, it means that we will have a torque in the motor of 0 0.29 nanometers. So it's pretty neat. The electrical system is a little bit fancier, and, and this is the main part where, where we have the compounds that must be important. This, uh, this robot uses an Intel NUC with a low consumption rate uh, and we have an, I, an RFID reader because we read the shelves not by camera but an R R RFID. We have the battery and the battery counter because we need to see the level of the batteries to, 
to see which time we should re recharge. A ward controller for the, the age bridges, the motors, that is, uh, can be found by Bosch, for example, in Brazil. Uh, an encoder, a magnetic encoder, four, four times motor encoder. We have also uh, a LED ring that's needed to signalize some things that we must know about the robot, for example, uh, the charge of the battery, if there is a, a problem, or even to uh, illuminate the, the camera that used uh, wind, uh, below the robot to read the localization system. It's a camera module uh, with a specially focus on, on identification marks for um, IO, IoT applications. We have also a dual band a wireless card, a USB I2C uh, interface, a LiDAR Garmin to detect collision in front of the robot and an IMU sensor. So usually the protocols that we use with these peripherals are USB, M2, PC, PCI, I2C for the sensors, most of them, and, in, and the, 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 the motor. Ward for the age bridge and ward for the, the LEDs, the LED ring. The electrical consumption is also really, really straightforward because we have the total power divided in three parts. The first one, of course, is the total power. The second is the power that comes from electrical consumption. The third is the power losses. And the fourth is the power of the motor consumption. So I, I, we differentiate motor and electrical consumption the, due to the fact that the motor consumption is much higher. For the energy losses, we take into account sensible devices such as age bridges and uh, the motors. Our age bridges have a maximum efficiency of 88% of load. Uh, the load estimation is based on a regime uh, with the robot like 50% on, with low with payload and 50% without payload of 150 kilos uh, the the loading and, lo and unloading uh, switches occurs every two minutes with a four almost five seconds to lift the the hack uh, so in the end we have also uh, a power and current for electrical electronics in the total, the motors and the losses, which means that in the end we have 12 hours, a little bit more, but let's say 12 hours of non-stop working of this robot lifting 150 kilos. So too, too many hours, right? The idea now is to expand the lifting system and the current electrical system so the robot can lift up to 800 kilos, which is not that problematic as well. In the end, I have to present a simulation world. Uh, this is based in Gazebo, this is the warehouse, this is the recharging part, this is the picking of the refilling of goods in the shelves. This is the picking uh, area, so we have three picking areas. This size is like 12 by 9 meters. So this actually is the size of the place to uh, simulate the robots in laser. We have a space 12 meters by 9 meters. So this is what the environment would uh, look like in the real world, the real size. This area here is a human uh, walking area and humans do not walk inside this part. The robot runs and comes into here and the, 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 the human picks up the goods. This is the environment, this is the robot, you can see already the environment with the robot. And here I have a video of the first, one of the first simulations we made, putting the robot to move. This doesn't have uh, the teleoperation yet is just applying forces on the motors so as you can see the the robot moves exactly as 
uh, predicted, it's well suited for the environment. This environment is, a scale, is a scalable, I can increase that and put more shelves and uh, do all kind of stuff, uh, including the simulation of the localization that's based on April tags. Well, uh, thank you for your attention. I'm glad to answer any questions. Please send me an email. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the authors of this work. And let's go on. The, the question can be sent by email or by Discord. We have a channel on Discord to discuss about this, this work uh, uh, that we presentation present here. Uh, the next session they share is Valdi. Valdi, uh, you can uh, assume from now. And thank you everyone for the attention. Good afternoon and bye bye. For me, you listening? Valdi? Yes, yes, I'm here. <laughs> Good, Valdi. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you, Rivaldo. <laughs> I'm sorry for the late and feel free to... Uh, that, that, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, my name is Valdir Graci Jr. I'm a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, we are on the third session of vision sensing mapping and path planning. And uh, the first, uh, the first uh, work of this session is, uh, is going to be presented by Yuri Santos. Um, and uh, the, the title of the paper is Deep Enforcement Learning for Visual Semantic Navigation with Memory. Um, Yuri, are, are you ready? Uh, you can, I guess you can share your presentation. Okay, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I will share the, the screen. You have um, at 15 minutes, we including questions to present your, your work. Mm, all right, all right. Are you seeing the screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will present the work Deep Reinforcement Learning for Visual Semantic Navigation with Memory. The authors of this paper is me, Yuri Batista Santos, and Roseli Aparecida Francelin Romero. We are with the Instituto de Ciencias Matemáticas e de Computação, ICMC USP, and the Laboratory de Aprendizado de Robots. Navigation is a complex and crucial activity with central role for mobile robots. Proper navigation is essential to the insertion of mobile robots in day-by-day -day environments, like offices, public spaces and homes. These social robots should be capable to handle complex and mutable environments. When searching a target in a determined local, such as an object, we commonly rely on peripheral sensors like vision and hearing. In robotics, we can take advantage of several sensor devices to gather information from the surroundings. When social environments like homes, non-stationary objects can be targets to be found in a target-derived manner. For object search, visual input, semantic reasoning, and learning-based navigation with deep reinforcement learning provides an interesting and rich combination of approaches. Visual navigation uses sensors like cameras as main or unique inputs of information about the surroundings. These approaches can take advantage of a wide range of information as detection of objects. Also, the semantic context about the relations between objects can enhance the agent's understanding of its surroundings, like infer how a target object can be linked to other objects in the environment. Young et al. explored these approaches in a learning-based navigation alongside the deep reinforcement learning agents. Extend models of visual semantic navigation with memory networks like GRU and LSTM's models present an interesting subject of exploration and enhancement to models with vault memory mechanisms. 
With these modifications, we can evaluate how the robot agents could take advantage of remembery experiences of the past, improving its behavior in the present and future episodes. Memory mechanism can be used alongside deep reinforcement learning to navigate through indoor home scenes, together with visual information and semantic context. We aim to explore the advantages and alterations in the behavior of an agent in a simulated indoor environment in home context, based on the work proposed by Young et al. We propose to extend this work by the addition of a memory network. We compare the results of the original model without a memory mechanism and with a memory network proposed by us. We intend to observe and evaluate the behavior of the agent in the search to find the target objects. This figure presents the architectural model proposed by us. It's composed by four modules, uh, the visual module, the semantic module, the memory module, and learn module. Uh, the visual module is composed by a convolutional neural network and compute the and compute the input image from the actual scene of the, the environment. The ConvNet outputs a vector encoding the objects detected in the image. This vector is used in two moments, as part to compose a joint vector and as visual information in the semantic module. The semantic module is composed by a word in a bedding. In our model, we use GLOVE and a, convol a graph convolutional network. The word in the bed is computed to all objects in the environment, including the target object. In turn, the GCN uses a graph of relations between objects, using the word in the bed and the visual information and the adjacent matrix of objects, built previously to infer the relations between all objects and the objects being seen in the actual observation of the agent, or to put in at the end a vector encoding of these relationships. The vector for the visual module, the word in embedding for the target object, and the output of the GCN are all joined in a joint vector, which is the input of the memory module. The memory module is our main contribution to this architecture. We adopt intercambially a GRU and a LSTM. With that, the architecture model can take advantage of the past experiences of the agent in the ambience learning the best policies to navigate in future episodes. The memory module outputs a 512 dimension vector that is input to the learning module. The learning module receives the output from the memory module and uses an actor critic model in, the, in a deep reinforcement learning approach to, na to learn navigate policies through experiences in the environment. So the key points in our work are a target driving approach where the agent search for a specific object in the scene, non-use of topological or geometric map of the environment due to the changeable feature of the environment, rely on a static map of the ambience could impose its limitations to the navigation of a flexible agent meet, and the adoption of a learning-based navigation with deep reinforcement learning, relying on vision, semantic, and memory. For training, the deep reinforcement learning agent navigated in four distinct scene categories, living room, kitchen, bedroom, and bathroom. Each scenario has a different composition in objects, textures, decoration, and schemes. Also, some categories as the living room and the kitchen are usually have larger scenes. The agent should navigate in these scenes relying only on the visual input information, taking actions accordingly to its learned internal policies. A successful episode is when the, tar the agent takes down action, being sufficiently near the target object and with it on the agent fired of view. Otherwise, the episode terminates as failed. We present quantitative and qualitative results. Uh, was obtained graphics of the mean of the total reward of the episodes during training. And quantitative results using metrics like success rate and success rate weighted by path length were adopted to evaluate the model's performance. And finally, we present qualitative results with the execution of the agent training model in a simulated environment with visualization. Uh, this graphic presents the mean total reward obtained by the agent during each training run, a total of five per model, grouped by three models. Um, we bought memory mechanism, our baseline and original model similar to Young et al, the GCN and LP. And with memory, 
um, GCN GRU and GCN LSTM with GRU and LSTM networks, respectively. We can observe that the GCN MLP and GCN LSTM presented more stable behavior, while the GCN GRU presented a high oscillation in its multiple executions. Also, the GCN MLP and GCN GRU and have in mean similar results, but some runs of the GCN GRU demonstrated better results, being more close to the um, LS, GCN LSTM. The GCN LSTM presented the best results of all models, gathering the high final mean and the low variance. Concerning the CPL, uh, the success rate and success rate by the net by path length metrics, we compared the red CTED models with random agents and agents with pure HVC policies. Also, we evaluated the models in two settings, considering all episodes without restrictions, and a more difficult setting where we considered all episodes when the target object was at last five steps away from the initial position of the agent. We can observe that the models with memory addition demonstrated um, better performances, especially the GCN LSCM, the best one, for both metrics evaluated and in both settings. We also can note that the models with a memory better maintained the performance, showing less decrease in result values when compared both to the simple setup as with the other models. For qualitative results, we present execution on the simulated environment for the GCN MLP, GCN GRU, and GCN LSTM. In this figure mosaic, the agent was in a scene from the living room category with the chair as the target object. Uh, as shown by the green border in the last frame, the GCN GRU and GCN LSTM performed successful episodes, reaching a chair at the termination moment close enough and visible to the agent. Here's the chair for the GCN LSTM. Here's the chairs to the GCN GRU, um, but the GCN MLP failed, maintaining itself in the same region for most of the episode execution, not exploring the surroundings. And as you can see, there is no chair at the end of the episode. In conclusion, the memory mechanisms added in, in our work demonstrated to have improved the results for navigation agents on simulated environments in target object approach with vision, semantic, and deep reinforcement learning. The GRU and the LSTM network showed more exploratory policies, avoiding early terminations and obtaining more successful results for distant target objects. And finally, with our comparative results for both member networks, despite the unstable behavior during training, GRU is to present an interesting network alongside uh, LSTM. Future works include exploring high abstraction levels of semantic context, like relationships between same categories or objects and scenes. Also, in several episodes, the memory and said models performed longer than accessory trajectories, continuing the navigation even when the target object has been seen in the surroundings and was close enough. More efficient termination are interesting to increase the model's performance. Incorporate physical awareness like obstacle avoidance is also an investigation path. And finally, apply the learned models trained in simulated environments on real ambiences with real robots. We acknowledge the third agencies that provide financial support for this work and for all knowing this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, uh, for the for the uh, presentation of your work. Um, please, uh, I would like to know if you, anyone has questions for to Yuri. There's no questions from YouTube, from the audience. Uh, I have a, a quick question, Yuri. Uh, uh, I. Uh, in one uh, day slide, you showed the qualitative results. Uh, there are two cases uh, where the method succeeds. Um, one, uh, in both cases, uh, both cases, the chair are visible or not? No, the first case, the second case, the, the chair is not visible initially, right? Uh, you are worrying about this. 
Yes, this uh, the GRU and uh, it starts uh, the 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 chair oh. is is yeah, understand. Um, in fact, I'm just showing the last five steps. Ah, okay. And all, all the agents okay. beginning very far from the target object. Ah, okay. And uh, you can see here in the the T uh, minus two in the GCNMLP, this is far mm -hmm. from the the target object. And this is this is seen in the image, but the agent couldn't um, see this chair because all right. um, the the visualization and the object is only visible to the agent when it's less than one meter of distance. Okay. So we can see that on visual input, but the agent itself in the simulated environment cannot. And so this, this all this trajectory is longer than, than the figure. The figure just uh, shows the last five. The last five, all oh, right, okay. Yeah. And uh, just curiosity, how, how long does it take to, to train uh, your deep reinforcement learning with yeah, in, you, in, you are talking in, in days. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah, this, all, all the models, I trained all the models for 3.5 million epochs. Okay. And for the GCN LSTM, this last, I mean, four days. For okay. GCN GRU, I mean, two to three days. Okay. And the GCN MLP, um, close to that, two and three days also. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, for each run, uh, I, I uh, run uh, five models for each architecture. So for each one of these models um, was four days, two days and three days. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? If... I have a question. Okay, bro. Right. So you uh, thank you for your presentation. Congratulations for your work. Um, I'd like to know um, what are the um, what what do you have to do to use this in a actual you know in a, um, actual slum system uh, in which a robot uses to navigate an unknown um, environment. So would it be feasible since um, you you would need a um, uh, training session beforehand. Um, I, I don't know if you understood. Yeah, I don't know if I understood you well. You, you're talking about Islam. Yes. Uh, like, uh, I think that I doesn't understand your question. You can clarify. So, uh, so um, you, I think maybe, maybe Bruno is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, maybe Bruno is, uh, is one to, would like to know if, uh, um, how this could be implement, implemented in a real system or yeah. oh it's exactly yeah, this. <laughs> like in, in, a, in a real environment or, or yes. you want to say yes. yeah in a real environment we just um in for our, our project here we just use image input image input but if you want to put that in on a real robot it, this, this is not robust enough to to put in a real environment yet mm -hmm. so but if you if you want to, to take advantage of this kind of approach in a real environment today, you can use that together with these other techniques. You can build, I don't know, a, a, a topological map more, more sparse, not so, so hard to build because the, the biggest advantage with this approach is that you are not limited to the representation, the topological representation of the environment. So in cases like in a house where you have uh, this kind of target objects that are non-stationary, like a remote control, you, you can't, um, with a topological map, it, it, uh, it's not sufficient to, to track that, the, that position in real time, every time. So for this kind of uh, target, uh, targets that doesn't have a specific location, you can take advantage of this visual input and this kind of uh, model to direct uh, your robot in, I don't know, in, the, in, the, in a short path. You know, you can use other techniques to do a path, uh, a longer path uh, and planning, and in the short path, you can use uh, this kind of technique, maybe. I don't know if Thank I you. answered Thank your you. question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, Thank you. We are uh, 
we are going to to move ahead to the next uh, work. Uh, the next next work uh, is going to be presented by Alessandra Haybolt. Hey uh, um, the title is Comparative Evaluation of Feature Descriptors Through Bag of Visual Features with Multilayer Perceptron on Embedded GPU System. Alessandra, uh, are, are you ready to present? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, can you share? Could you, could you share your screen, please? Are you seeing the presentation? Not yet. Yes. And now? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am pleased to present to you this work, which is the result of preliminary activities, expecting my dissertation master degree carried out in the computer science and computer systems graduate program offered by the Military Engineering Institute under the guidance of Professor Paulo Rosa and co-supervised by Professor Alberto Angones. Well, my master thesis team consists of working with Mudlier in loop closure detection based on deep learning. Loop closure detection is one of the most significant steps in a VSLAN or VSLAN system. This is because loop closure detection consists of recognizing previous map locations by a mobile robotic platform. Correct loop closure detections can be used to correct odometry, which is a process used to estimate the purpose of a particular agent. Therefore, it is possible to reduce the accumulation of errors in the location estimate along the trajectory of the robotic platform. And with that, we have the possibility to build more consistent maps. Most techniques and methods for solving multiple detection are based on bag of visual world methods while deep learning resources such as convolutional neural networks, despite being explored in this long system, is not fully explored for the loop closure detection test. So we aim to build a system capable of solving loop closure detection problem with the proposal of correcting the drift in the estimated calculations of visual odometry for a VSLAN system, combining the use of an integrated monocular camera with an adaptation of a hybrid model, the long-term recurrent convolutional neural network. Therefore, we intend to achieve the same objective of correct de detection of loop clues through resources based on deep learning, where the proposed system is, is executed in real time. So the purpose of the input step consists of the configuration and calibration of the monocular camera to obtain sequential images. The purpose of the filter detection step is to, pro is, is to produce filter detection process through the descriptors that we'll be choosing at the end of the experiments presented in this work. The filter extraction step consists in to compute the descriptors obtained in the previous step. So to reformulate the same computer descriptors through convolutional filters, the adaptation of the proposed convolutional neural network achieved the same goals as a traditional convolutional neural network. The ultimate purpose of this step is the adaptation of a hybrid model as a represented, the CNN-LSTN. The challenge of this proposal is to investigate the best method to achieve the reformulation and the implementation of a new convolutional layer of the proposed system. So uh, we are trying to, to design a model with efficiency and efficient computational performance. And the, the loop close detection step consists in, in the, implement, the implementation of loop close detection for this non system itself. Therefore, the loop close detection will, will, will be based on a hybrid model developed in the previous step. So, in this initial work, we are concerned with evaluating an approach of the bag of visual world techniques, extracting filters using local filter descriptors and local binary descriptors on the NVIDIA microcompiler, the Jetsunami, for recognition and classification tasks, 
into six visual data sets using the move layer perceptor. This preliminary work is essential as we hope that the experiment and the simulations will lead us to the right choice of a descriptor that will be used in the future works, in the future detection step, and have formulated in the future extraction step into convolutional filters of the proposed convolutional neural network architecture. And empirically, if the filter vectors operate swiftly together with our classifier, we can assume that it also operates swiftly with the proposed convolutional neural network. So, to choose the best descriptors, the efficiency of five local binary descriptors was evaluated. They are brief, or risk, AKZ, and FIC. We also choose to evaluate three local filter descriptors, SIFT, SURF, and KZ. The first step to be carried out in this experiment was the future extraction for each descriptors in the visual data sets. Here, you can see all visual data sets reorganized, consider the size, that is, amount of images multiplied by, multiplied by resolution. Jaffe is a lightweight visual data set, and FAIR 2013 was the heavy visual data set. As all visual data sets, except FAIR, have small images, it was not possible to obtain results using brief, AKZ, and free. This is because to avoid the return of key points without the scrapers, the brief AKZ and FIC algorithm remove the key points. Whatever, with the same descriptors, it was possible to obtain results in the phases of data set because the size of the image of the, this visual data set is more si significant for this step of filter extraction. And, and all the scrapers try to extract filters with Jaffe and phases of data sets, they, the results are obtained almost instantly because both visual data sets have few samples in the training set. So in the table presented, we can observe the processing time in minutes in filter extract step for the SIFT, SURF, KZ, ARP, and RISC in the MNIS, extended JK plus, C410, and FAIR 2013 visual data sets. Among the local filter descriptors, SURF is the one that takes the least time to extract filters, while among the local binary descriptors, ORB is the one that takes the least time. As MNEs have small image, the same case there occurs in BRISC, sorry, with BRIF, AKZ, and FREAK happens with BRISC. And in this case, it was not possible to obtain results. Well, the next step of this work is to use the K-means cluster algorithm to obtain the index of the bag of Zofit stacking and then obtain the frequency history. Therefore, when talking about the adjacent and phases of data sets, the performance for generating the filter vectors by K-means algorithm for all these graphs occur instantly. And then the process time in the training and test set for the generation of the filter vectors for the SIFT, SURF, KZ, ARP, and RISC in all of these visual data sets can be seen in the table presented. SURF take less time to generate the filter vectors than all these local filter descriptors, while BRISC achieve the best results compared to, to the most local binary descriptors. When generating the filter vectors using the Kimmins algorithm, we can now train the classifier using the layer perceptor. And from now on, we can receive the result achieved through the layer perceptor models, where the performance and efficiency of six different parameter sets were evaluated for all the descriptors in the field visual data set. While all the descriptors on the other visual data sets, the models obtain a high hair of, of overfitting. At the same time, other models obtain a high hair of underfitting. With this, we observe that the best result achieved with, with each descriptor on the presented classifier were over the field visual data set, where the highest classification percentage obtained was with the multi-layer perceptor called MLP6 on the visual data set FAKE with AKZ, where we observe, where we obtain a classification, classification rate of 86%. Other local binary descriptors that stand out with the FAKE visual data set are BRIEF and BRISC. 
to reduce computations and substantially the number of learning parameters during the training step of the convolutional neural network activity, we opted to use allocal binary disruptors. This can result in computational saving and memory requirements, make it an applicable model in real environments that have resources, that have limited resources. Thus, we chose to use the BRISC as the main disruptors to be used in the next step of this work. So these disruptors provide excellent results in relation to the invariance to quotation, scale, lighting, and viewpoint in many other works. Therefore, in this figure, we can see the convolutional matrix of the MLAD PIC5 model on the phases of data set with BRISC. In this context, the model color MLP size on the visual data set fade with the risk obtaining accuracy of 84%. In our approach, we choose to use the Python programming language and the TensorFlow and Keras libraries to build the deep learning models and the OpenCV libraries for activity related to computer vision and the use of filter descriptors. All the implementations and future updates will be available in the present and GitHub repository. So the descriptor to be used to be addressed in the future work in the future detection step and reformulated in the future extraction step into convolutional features of the convolutional neural network was defined. And now we can proceed to the next step in, this, in the future, future work. So our approach is promising, where we hope in the next step of this work to demonstrate that the proposed methods reduce the computational complexity of the model and have the potential to perform the task of detecting loop flows for a vision system. I would like to thank IMI, Robo IMI, Fayetej Petropolis, and Capish for their financial support provided. And a special thanks to my advisor, Professor Paulo Rosa, and my course, course advisor, Professor Alberto Gonez. Well, thank you for your participation. I am available for any clarification and doubts. And here you can find my contact details. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, we have questions. Uh, we have a, a, uh, some questions from Roseli. Um, she asks, uh, how did you deal with images of different sizes? You you mentioned that there are there are, uh, there are some in your work used uh, images with different size uh, sizes and how, how did you deal with with that? And also mm -hmm. uh, the connection between the the traditional visual methods with those of deep, deep learning uh, you introduced. Have you have you already linked the traditional feature detection methods with the deep, deep learning method? Or is this a future work? Okay. Um, regarding the, the image, no? mm -hmm. um, in, the, in, in this first step, um, we're not covered, um, how can I say that? Just one minute, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alessandra, uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, can you can you interact with the with uh, with Roseli, uh in the in the chat? Because uh, we are a little bit behind of schedule. Sorry, Roseli, Sorry, okay, Paulo. Okay. Uh, could you please uh, maybe could you, uh, answer the uh, uh, Roseli's question? And also, Paulo is uh, is is also asking. Okay. Yeah. Zoom. 
Uh, it will be better for me. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank sorry, you. Uh, sorry. We are we are a little behind of schedule, uh, so we need to move on. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Alessandra. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the next work, uh, uh, the next work is going to be presented by Gustavo Carvalho. Uh, the title of the work is Performance Analysis of Code-Based Relative GPS Positioning as Function of Baseline Separation. Gustavo, uh, are you ready to present? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we, we can hear. I, I will present using my video because I have a noisy neighborhood here. So okay. I'll start. Okay, Bruno, can you can you share the video that uh... I can do that here if you don't mind. I have it here. Okay. <laughs> uh, can you hear the video? Not yet. Not no, yet. no, no. Let, let me double check here. Volume. And now I'm a student in the master's. Not yet. Yes, yes. Okay. Now it's fine. You can okay. play. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Hello everyone, my name is Gustavo Carvalho. I'm a student in the master's degree program in System and Automation Engineering at Federal University of Labras, and I will present the work entitled Performance Analysis of Code-Based Relative GPS Position as Function of Baseline Separation. Here is the summary, how the presentation is organized, and we can start defining what is Global Navigation Satellite System. It is a satellite navigation system capable to provide accurate, worldwide and three-dimensional position, velocity and navigation information to users' proper equipment. The first system created was the US GPS and it quickly became the dominant navigation system all over the world. However, currently there are other three systems in full operation capability and they are GLONASS, Beidou and Galileo. These systems, they provide three types of measurements in order to estimate the position. And they are pseudo ramps, Doppler shifts, and carrier phase. We will focus on pseudo range measurements in this work. Many modern day applications have a rise in demand in navigation technologies with submeter position accuracy. But GNSS accuracy lies on the range of 5 to 10 meters due to some sources of errors that can be classified in two groups. The first one is the common mode errors that, that are timely and especially uh, correlated, and they include ephemeris error, satellite clock bias, and ionospheric and tropospheric delays. The second group is the non-common mode errors that are different for each receiver, and they include receiver clock bias, multipath error, and receiver tracking noise. There are uh, several techniques available to mitigate common mode errors, including the differential GNSS and relative GNSS. Both of them need a reference station equipped with a GNSS receiver and installed in a surveyed location. But they are prone to two degradation factors. Uh, the baseline separation, which is the physical distance between the reference station and the rover, uh, uh, the moving receiver, and the communication latency between the rover and the reference station. We will focus on relative GNSS here. W with that said, the main goal of this work is to study the effect of baseline separation on our GNSS position estimation occurs. And we want to provide a comprehensive analysis relating the maximum baseline distance between reference station and rover and the feasibility of RGNSS submitter position accuracy. The relevance of this work is that many segments would benefit from more accurate position estimation, including the autonomous vehicles and precision agriculture. 
uh, special emphasis in the second topic because agribusiness represented 21.4% of Brazilian gross domestic, domestic product last year. To proceed the study, the materials and methods used were the Brazilian network for continuous monitoring of GMSS data. Uh, it is the most precise geodetic, geodetic reference structure in Brazil. Uh, it, it is equipped with high performance GMSS receivers installed in serve, survey location all over the country, as we can see in figure two. And they provide GMSS raw data in three different ways in real time, in daily basis, simply interval of 15 seconds, and every 15 minutes with simple interval of one second. And these data can be accessed online. For position estimation, the standalone GNSS approach was used, uh, where the pseudo range model is expressed by this equation, where we have the true position and the errors discussed earlier. And here we have the common mode errors. To find a uh, position solution, we use the extended common filter, where the state vector was defined as the rover position, rover velocity, rover clock bias, and rover clock drift. Since the receiver clock and the satellite clock are not synchronized, we want to ex estimate uh, this clock bias as well. The dynamic model is defined, defined as the, the, the derivative of position is the velocity, the der derivative of clock bias is the clock drift, and the derivative of velocity and clock bias and clock drift is zero. We also use the partial corrections for common mode errors in this approach, and they include the Klobuchar model for ionospheric delay, UNB3 model for tropospheric delay and satellite clock corrections in GPS navigation message. Another approach to estimate the position was the relative GNSS, uh, where the main idea behind it is to form differences between the pseudo ranges in the reference station and the rover, so that the common mode errors can be uh, cancelled out when we subtract, subtract them. And as we can see, the single difference pseudo range model can be built. And now we have only the distance between reference and user and the non common mode errors, since the common mode were cancelled out. To estimate the position, the extended common filter was also used. And now the state vector is the relative position of the rover with respect to the reference station and relative velocity, the relative receiver clock bias, and relative receiver clock drift. The dynamic model remains the same. The methodology applied here was to select a station from uh, RBMC to, to be our main station, and we used the, the both approaches to estimate the position. The station selector was the EACH located in Sao Paulo, as we can see in the figure 3. Uh, the standalone GPS was used to estimate the position, and the relative also was used. For the second approach, we used other 13 stations uh, with different dis distance in the range of 0 to 3416 kilometers. And to assess the performance, three criteria were selected, which are the individual chain of position error, the horizontal position error, and the total position error. Uh, now, to, to compare the performance, we have the individual chain of errors over the time for standalone GPS and for the relative DNSS. Uh, where we can see that relative GNSS has an improved performance since the mean errors uh, are closer to, it, to zero, as we can see in the figure five. Uh, and we also can see in table one that summarizes the position error statistics, statistics that for our GNSS we have 
a better performance. The mean errors are close to zero for each criteria we have chosen. North is now positioned, horizontal and total error, indicating that the common mode errors were uh, mitigated in an effective way. And another outcome that we can notice here is that in the GPS time of the week, at 3.888 times 10 power 5 seconds, which corresponds to 12 p.m., Ooh, we can see a slight decreasement of the errors in each individual channel, leading to a better position accuracy. This effect cannot be seen in the RGNSS because uh, the ephemeris errors are already mit mitigated, regardless of the, the ephemeris time of validity. validity. For baseline separation analysis, we estimated the EACH station position and we use the box plot to show the errors as a function of baseline separation and use the both approaches. The first box of each graphic is the position estimation error performed by standalone GNSS approach and the remaining boxes we use the relative GNSS approach. Uh, we can see that the position errors increase uh, when we use reference stations with, uh, that are located farther from the ECH station, but they are still under the meter level. And we can see that with distance starting from 1200 kilometers, the box's length gets uh, uh, Get greater, indicating that the position errors of variability gets greater. And in table two, we can see that when we use reference stations with distance greater than 2,000 2, kilometers, the performance of relative GNSS becomes similar to the standalone GNSS, or even ro worse, when we used over the 3,000 kilometers, as we can see here in the Saga reference station. As conclusion, we could see that submeter position accuracy is possible at 68% of probability uh, when we use reference stations with distance up to 2,157 kilometers. And we also could see that RGNSS is eff effective to correct common mode errors for a great range of distance, up to 2,000 kilometers. And for future works, uh, we want to extend the same study uh, for moving platforms equipped with low-cost real-time RGNSS, since this study was performed in a stationary scenario in, with post-processed -process data. And we also want to investigate the effect of communication latency in the RGNSS approach. Uh, here are the references I used in the presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention, and now if you have any questions, I can answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, are there Yes, are there I'm any here. Uh, yes. Uh, any questions from the audience or uh, YouTube? If not, uh, okay, uh, no questions from YouTube. Gustavo, uh, as we are right on the schedule, I think mm -hmm. we are going to move to the next uh, presentation. And thank you so much for, uh, for your presentation. Please, uh, if you, uh, any, any, um, uh, uh, there's a reminder from the organization here that uh, everyone that we are uh, going to, we are going to have a cultural event today at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, so uh, you can uh, join, join us uh, through Zoom, right, Bruno? Uh, so, if you want to participate, please uh, please connect through Zoom uh, for our cultural event.
uh, the best paper will be announced. Uh, okay, so we are going to move to the to the next uh, to the next presentation. Um, where, sorry about that. Uh, we have uh, we have the last paper of the session of the session. Uh, Adrien uh, is going to present uh, the work uh, entitled "A Visual Predictive Control Scheme for a Mobile Robot Navigating a Cluttered Environment." So, please, uh, Adrien, uh, you can you may start. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So welcome to the presentation of the work entitled Visual Predictive Control Scheme for a Mobile Robot Navigating in a Cultured Environment. This work is the result of the collaboration between Vivian Canna from the Université de Toulouse, France, and myself, Adrien durand petit from uh, UFP in Brazil. So in this work, we focus on the image-based navigation problem. And we consider a differential robot equipped with a camera mounted on a pad platform and also with a laser rangefinder. So for such a robotic system, the camera has only three degrees of freedom and the control input is composed of the linear and angular velocities of the mobile base and the angular velocity of the pad platform. So to perform the navigation, we rely on a landmark characterized by a set of points and the projection of the points on the image uh, plane, as we can see here, uh, also called the visual feature, are used to define the robot state. So the goal here is to drive the robot in order to make the visual features uh, converge towards their desired values. And the desired values here, they correspond to the uh, projection of the, the, the landmark uh, at the desired camera pose. So uh, in this work, it is proposed to uh, perform the navigation using a visual predictive control uh, scheme, which is the fusion of image-based visual servering with model predictive control. So the goal here is to compute the optimal uh, sequence of control inputs, uh, Q bar stars, that uh, minimize the cost function. So that minimization is done at each iteration, okay? And the cost function here, uh, J and P, is defined in the image space. So that's the part related to the image-based visual serving. So it's equal to the sum over the prediction horizon of the quadratic quadratic error between the predicted visual feature, the S uh, hat, and the desired uh, visual feature, S star. So to do so, we need a couple of things. First, we need a model to predict the visual features. So there are two kinds of model, the global and local ones, and they are presented in a paper from uh, Ali Bear from 2010. So I, I won't talk about that any further here. Then at each iteration, the estimation process uh, is initialized using the last measured visual features. And finally, <clears throat> and this is the interesting part about using IBVS with NPC, is that we can include a set of constraints. So in this work, we will add constraints in order to guarantee the stability of the closed loop system, in order to uh, take into account the boundaries of the control inputs of the actuators, and also in order to take into account, uh, to, to deal with obstacles. So this uh, optimization prob uh, problem uh, will be solved using a numerical uh, solver. And at each iteration, we will obtain a sequence of controls, but we will use only the first command. And every time uh, we will uh, move the robot, acquire new data and restart the optimization uh, process. So. First, to guarantee the closed loop stability, we use the terminal constraint. There are other options, but in this work, we use this one. So the terminal constraint guarantees the problem feasibility at each iteration. And the feasibility means there exists a solution leading to the desired state while dealing with the constraints. So, and the, this, this constraint, uh, actually, this is the error between the last predicted state and the desired state. 
So it means there, there exists a, a, a trajectory, the, the, the trajectory we have calculated connect the current poles to the desired one while dealing with constraints. So it means we need the trajectory which is long enough to connect the current poles and the desired one. So usually there are two ways to increase the length of the trajectory. First, we could increase the prediction horizon, but in this case, usually it's uh, time consuming to uh, predict all the states and then to solve the optimization problem. So another way could be to increase the control uh, input bounds. But somehow it doesn't make sense because those uh, bounds are used to represent the actual limits of the actual curves. But we're going to use to to work on the control input bounds. And here the idea is to divide the control input bounds into two subsets. So we have a first uh, subset, the tight boundaries that will generate tight uh, step steps in the predictions. And they represent the actual limits of the actuator. And those tight boundaries are used to compute a fine trajectory in the robot neighborhood. And this is where we have the most of the data about the obstacles. And so this is why we need a, a fine and smooth trajectory around the robot in order to have a, a nice uh, trajectory to avoid the obstacle and reach the goal. And then after that first part with tight boundaries, there is relaxed or extended boundaries uh, they do not have any physical sense. They are just used to complete the path from the end of the tight steps up to the desired pole. And to do so, we will obtain uh, a course uh, trajectory, which is fine because in that area, we have less data about the obstacles and usually it's kind of a free environment. So, which means with this, with those two, um, sets uh, subsets of constraints it's a way to obtain a long enough trajectory to respect the terminal constraints and to not increase too much the prediction horizon so finally because there are obstacles we would like to include an obstacle avoidance constraint so usually we the constraint is we have to guarantee there is a certain distance between the predicted states and the obstacles points representing the obstacles but here, because we have re relaxed input boundaries, we can have large displacement between two states. And in this case, we also have to check that the distance is uh, larger than a certain threshold uh, between the states, so along the trajectory. So in this work, we use a slightly modified version of the of, uh, obstacle avoidance constraint in order to guarantee the non-collision, not just for the states, but also between the states along the trajectory. So at this point, the visual predictive control uh, problem is, is defined. And now at each iteration, as I said, we will uh, sol uh, solve it with a numerical solver. But actually the problem starts to be quite complex. And especially because we have obstacles uh, constraints, we have a non-convex problem and we should not uh, expect the solver to provide us the optimal solution. So what does it mean? Here, the, the, the first um, trajectory, A, it's an example of what could be a global solution. So we have the trajectory, the green uh, segments represent the tight steps and the blue one, the extended one. So the idea is we a global solution should use the tight boundaries as much as possible. And then we complete the trajectory to reach the goal, the poles, with the extended boundaries. And what happened when we have a suboptimal solution? So we can see that the, the green, the tight steps are underused. So the, and then we have to overuse the extended uh, steps in order to complete the, the trajectory. So this could be fine, but what can happen? What can happen is that the first command, the one that we will apply at each iteration, it can be no. And in this case, the robot would be stuck in a local minima. So our solution, uh, the solution we, are, we have proposed here, it's to keep the, the, the path, but to modify the trajectory. So the, the, we will try to uh, increase the use of the tight boundaries and decrease the use of the expanded, extended uh, boundary steps. So to do so, we, will pro we, we propose a two steps uh, method. 
where we will merge command and extract new command. So there is a main tool to do so, and this is the equivalent control vector. So uh, roughly the idea is our system is an onolomic system and it can be the, the camera is an onolomic system in our case, and it can be controlled in one step. So it means there is a constant, constant is very important, control input vector Q tilde that can reach any camera state from any camera state. And that uh, constant control input vector Q tilde can be, uh, is computed from the two states uh, at different times. So in the paper, we explain how to, to compute that uh, uh, equivalent control uh, input vector. And we will use that tool for two things. First, to merge a set of control inputs, and then also to create new commands, new control inputs. So here we have a, an example of what could be, a, how it can be used to, to merge. We have uh, four states of the camera, three. Adrian, uh, yes. Uh, so, sorry to interrupt. We are not seeing the, the, fi the figure. Uh, I, I, the, the slides are, are cropped. I don't, I don't know why. Okay. Uh, uh, one sec, I will reopen it. Was it just for the last slide or? Uh, no, unfortunately, but uh, but only this last one, we, we couldn't see the, the, the figure. Okay. Can you use the full screen mode? Uh, yes. Do you see it? Uh, yeah, no, now it's okay. Yeah, it's better. Okay. Oh, no, it's it's cropping. Yeah, it's, it's still cropping. But, but uh, okay, okay, D don't worry. Uh, I think you, you, you may go on. Okay, so I will just... Um, yeah, I will just share the desktop. Okay. Do you see it now? Yeah, yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah, now, now it's better, much better. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Sorry for You're welcome. So we have four states and three commands, QK, QK plus one, QK plus two. And actually we could compute uh, for example, uh, a single control uh, input in order to reach k plus three from k plus one. So this is the main tool we're gonna use. So here, this is an example of how it can be used. We have first a uh, not optimal um, sequence. So greens are the tight commands and blue are the extended ones. And first we're gonna try to merge commands. So in this case, it's possible to merge Q1 and Q2 while respecting the tight boundaries. So if we try to merge uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, they don't respect the tight boundaries. So which means the, 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 the boundaries of the actuators. So, in, so we, we limit ourselves to Q1 and Q2. We merge them and we create here in this line, the, a, a new command Q, QM. So we can see here on the trajectory that that state here disappear. And now we have a new red uh, piece of trajectory. And uh, because one command disappear, we introduce a new no uh, control input in, in, the, in the sequence. So that first part is to uh, deal with the underuse of the tight uh, command. So then in order to deal with the overuse of the extended ones, we will try to replace the null command with a new one. So the idea here is to use the first extended command and to extract a tight command here represented by the uh, orange uh, piece and to update and to create again, uh, also a new uh, extended um, command. So this way we have reduced the use of the extended uh, command. So we will repeat this process. So we don't uh, take into account Q1 anymore. Now we start from Q2, so Q2, Q3, same thing. We merge them. That state here disappear. So we have a new piece of trajectory. And again, in the extended part, we extract a new piece of trajectory, a tight one, and we update the extended one. So the goal of this is to increase the optimality of the solution. So most likely we won't have the optimal uh, solution. 
but so we will increase the optimality and more more important the robot won't be stuck in a local minima or at least it will exit the local minima so here are, are some examples uh, so this is the environment we have the robot and obstacle the landmark we will use to navigate that's the camera pose we want to reach the predicted pose and trajectory like you see the image space with the visual feature the current and the desired ones and the command so in the first scenario we use a prediction horizon of 15 steps and we don't have relaxed cons uh, constraints okay just right so the predicted um, trajectory here we can see it's too it's too short to um, it's too short to 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 connect to the desired pose and in this case the robot so there is no guarantee about stability and the robot reach uh, local minima. In the second case, we introduce five relaxed constraints. So now the predicted trajectory is long enough so we can reach the desired pose. But because we don't compute the optimal solution, the robot still gets stuck in a local minima. So in the third scenario, it's the same, except we will modify the obtained trajectory with those two steps method merging and uh, creating new command in order to exit any local minima. So this is what happened here. So the robot here, it should be stuck in the local minima, but we modify, it, we, we increase the optimality of the solution and the robot can exit that local minima. So it achieved the navigation task while avoiding the obstacle. The boundaries here on the commands are still taken into account. So this is a success. So in this work, we have presented the, the uh, an image-based uh, navigation using a visual predictive controller where, so it means we define the task in the image space, and then we can also add constraints. So first constraint is the terminal constraint in order to guarantee the stability, but it requires to have a long predicted, pre, um, predicted trajectory. So to do so, we use tight and extended control input boundaries. And finally, we also take into, a, uh, we add uh, an, a constraint in order to avoid a collision with obstacles. And finally, we have presented a two steps method in order to increase the solution optimality and more important to prevent uh, the robot to be stuck in a local minimum. So currently we are working on a couple of uh, problems. So first, regarding the non-optimality of the problem. So we are trying to see if using different kind of visual features, here we use only points, or a different solver. So I may, for, forgot to mention that we use the SQP solver for an LOPT library. So maybe um, solver from genetic algorithm could be used to obtain the optimal solution. So that's uh, something to investigate. We also would like to take a more realistic uh, obstacle avoidance problem. So what's the impact when we discover piece by piece the obstacle? What's the impact on stability? We would like to take into account dynamic obstacles. Third point, we are using now a laser rangefinder. We would like to have a pure image-based obstacle avoidance, a pure uh, image-based navigation uh, system. And finally, also uh, we are using uh, deep new implementation in order to uh, predict the state uh, of the visual features and to speed up the optimization problem. Thank you very much for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, we have a question uh, from Roseli Romero. Uh, what is the computational cost, cost involved? Uh, is it possible to use the proposed approach online? Could you comment on, on that, please? Sure. So th this is the reason why we have two subsets. As I said, the, the first uh, solution could be to use I don't know, 60 uh, steps in the prediction horizon, but it would be really slow. So here we can limit ourselves to 10, 15 prediction steps. And like, so on my computer, it's something about 50 milliseconds. So okay. yes, definitely the optimization part, then there is the image processing and other things. But the optimization part is, is about 50 milliseconds. Okay, okay. We are trying Thank to you. speed up that part with the use of uh, GPU. GPU, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this was the last 
presentation of the third section. Uh, the the organized uh, committee is uh, asking me to remind that today at 7 p.m. Uh, a musical performance will be bro broadcasted online through YouTube. Uh, and also uh, they are going to announce the best papers of Lars SBR 2020. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I will, I will now uh, please the next chair of the session. Uh. Hi, Valdir. Thank you very much for presenting the, the previous section. Uh, I believe we are a bit late. Uh, Sorry, Vinicius, about that. <laughs> we no, 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 no. Right just, uh, <laughs> previous delay. No, no worry. Uh, just to, to, to start uh, fair, quickly to try to, to keep in, in time or uh, the same delay we, we had. Uh, well, this is the, the section VSMP4. Uh, I you check if the, the authors of the paper, the first paper, are present? Yes. Can you guys uh, hear me? Uh, okay, we can uh, start with your presentation. Okay, uh, so since you're behind schedule a bit, I'm going to present it via the video I have already recorded, if, you, if that's not a problem. Okay, can you guys see the video? I haven't had played it. Yes, it's it's okay. What what about the audio? Is it too low? Is it okay? paper called for accelerometer calibration using an extended two-step methodology? Alongside with me, Felipe. Is the Hi. audio volume okay? Yes, it's okay. The audio for me here. Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna play it. Thanks. Hi, I am Rogério, and today I'm going to present the paper called Traxial Accelerometer Calibration Using an Extended Two-Step Methodology. Alongside with me, Felipe, Gustavo, and Leonardo. So our summary, introduction, error model, extended two-step calibration, simulated results, experimental results, conclusion, and acknowledgements. Starting with the introduction. So accelerometers are sensors used in a variety of applications from uh, vertical sensing in smartphones and vibration monitoring to navigation, which is our focus here. Alongside with gyroscopes, accelerometers constitute what's called inertial measurement unit. It's called inertial measurement unit because it senses with respect to an inertial frame. You can combine many types of data and sensors into one navigation solution that's called integrated navigation and inertial navigation is one of these types of um, navigation aid that can be combined. Um, a very important technology for integrated navigation is the microelectromechanical systems called MAMS. They are very accessible, they are improving a lot their performance, and they are very accessible also in terms of uh, cost. You can buy them at a much lower cost than previous technologies. Um, however, sometimes they need to be calibrated and that's the reason of this paper in field calibration. Sometimes the calibration cannot be performed in the lab because the errors that appear are 
called run to run errors. In other words, they appear every time the sensor is turned on. So then they need to be calibrated as soon as the sensor is turned on in field. So let's have a grasp of how this is done. First, the error model. Basically, four types of error corrupt a measurement of an accelerometer. First, what we call the C sub M, which is the misalignment matrix. It's basically a function of uh, the angles, the misalignment angles in the accelerometer mounting, which is the non orthogonalities between them. The, they should be orthogonal between each other, the uh, X, Y, and Z sensors, but they are not. So the error produces a, an effect on the measurements, and this error can be calculated and compensated for. The second one is C sub SF, which is the scale factor, and C sub B, which is bias, and C sub M, which is uh, the noise considered here Gaussian white with zero mean. First, the biases are ju just to have a, a visual grasp, uh, they just add up constant error. Scale factors, ju they just scale up or down. Um, so the, the error is proportional to the magnitude of the measurement. The misalignments, as I explained it before, they are the tilt angles from what the sensor should be and what it really is. So we can take the x axis of the sensor and consider it to be the body axis, and then we are left with other three misalignment angles. So here is a very important part, and it, it, here is the basis of this uh, estimation, the, this calibration algorithm. If we have an accelerometer, static accelerometer, measuring at any location on Earth, the only thing it's going to measure, since it is static, is the acceleration of gravity. If we know that acceleration of gravity, we also know what to expect of the magnitude of the measurements. So here is, uh, that's exactly what's expressed in equation 3, right? So if we take the corrupted measurements from 4, 5 and 6, uh, take these equations and solve for a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z, and plug them back into 3, we have another thing. We have something, something different. But first let's think what we have in equation 3. That is the equation of a sphere, right? That's a sphere. Because Every time we turn the, the accelerometer around, the magnitude is constant, so it draws a sphere. However, if we corrupt that sphere, what does it become? It becomes an ellipsoid, a rotated, shifted ellipsoid. So our task here is to estimate this ellipsoid and convert it back into a sphere. That way, we are calibrating the sensor. So, the first step is to express this ellipsoid in terms of a quadratic surface with the parameters capital A, capital B, capital C. These are the parameters that we are estimating. And then, in the end, we convert them back into the error parameters let's estimate them. We rearrange equation 7 into equation 9, where x are the parameters we want, y and h are just a combination of measurements that we do in order to 
estimate x with a least squares. So we estimate x, which are the ellipsoid parameters. We take these parameters, convert them back into the error parameters, that is, biases, scale factors, misalignments, and then we can correct the measurements. That's what equation 14 is. Capital A hat is the corrected measurements. Now that we know how to do it, let's see some applications. First, a simulated scenario. We, pro we produced uh, simulated corrupted data uh, to which we know the, 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 cali the calibration parameters and we estimated the, the, the errors and compared them to the original. The result was very good. The error was always less than 0.01%. Uh, That's very good. The, the percent error. And here is a very interesting figure that illustrates what I've been talking about. On the left, we have the corrupted measurements that do not lie on the top of the sphere. It lies on the top of it in the ellipsoid, and then on the right, the corrupted measurements. Here's another very interesting graph, which is the magnitude error. Before the calibration in red, we have the magnitude error. It is, it's evidently um, not zero, and because the because of the errors that was that were corrupting it. Now that we correct for the errors, we have a a very close to zero line in blue. Another interesting thing: we evaluated how many orientations we need in order to have a good uh, performance and the, the number seems to be around 9 which makes sense since we have 9 uh, parameters to estimate. Here is the experimental results. We had very realistic uh, estimations and we also have a very realistic very uh, interesting result with respect to this plot. On the left, again, we have the corrupted measurements. On the right, the corrected measurements. We can see it, it is on top of the sphere on the right. And here, the magnitude error again. Uh, in red, before calibration, and in blue, after calibration. Finally, we used a platform, a real-time platform, uh, to embed our calibration algorithm to see how it would perform as an embedded system. It performed very well in this platform. Uh, it took only about 0.1 milliseconds to, uh, do, to run this task of the calibration, which is pretty uh, reasonable for navigation applications. So, in conclusion, we used a magnetometer calibration methodology for accelerometers with success. We have a, a satisfying performance with respect to simulation, real data, and embedded uh, system. And for future work, we wish to analyze a number of orientations uh, necessary to a good calibration in depth and we also want to uh, see how calibration improves the navigation solution. We'd like to acknowledge, to acknowledge the Federal University of Lavras and MWF Dynamics for providing the Q5 platform that, you, that we used. Here are some references. Thank you very much. We have questions from YouTube.
Okay, great. Okay, I have no questions from YouTube. Uh, I think we have one minute for questions, if you, anyone would like to pose. Uh, well, uh, if, some, if someone wants to more questions or details, we can, we can send email to the, to the authors uh, and we will go to the next uh, paper because we have to, to be in time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, thanks a lot, Vinicius. Thank uh, you, everybody. The second paper is Pedro, the author, is present. Can you hear me? Yes, Pedro, I can hear you very well. Oh, yes. Thank you very much for being here. You can share our presentation. Yes, I prefer to show the picture if there's no problem. Okay. I, okay, no problem. I'll share the screen. The video. Okay. Here. Are you seeing? Can you see the video? Yes, I can see. You can hear too? You can. I can hear very well. I cannot hear it in here, Pedro. I cannot hear too. It's low or it's no sound? Uh, for no. me, no sound. Oh. Uh... Let's see. I think your, uh, your sound system is very low, no? Mm, no. I try to. Hi, Pedro. Did you mark the option to share your video audio? Here? Uh, no, um, it's, it's not in settings. You can close this, uh -huh. yes. Um, so uh, up top on um, on the zoom options, you click uh -huh. on the three dots. I believe it's more. And Here? there you can you can see an option. Uh, I can see it. I can see it because you are only sharing your your video screen. I can't I can't see I can see zoom. Ah, uh, so, here. Okay. I I think I found. Okay. Let's try. Brazil from Federal University of Santa Maria. Now are you listening? And are you listening now? The volume is very low. And I represent to you the paper entitled I studied Google Glass Planners Algorithms for the Simulator Turtle Bot 3 Robots in Cross. Very, very low to me. For yeah. the presentation, I organize Put it on the system. maximum. I think already are. Yeah, it is. Maybe Emerson has. Maybe a... if. Uh... Maybe. Yes. Emer Emerson, Sorry? could you please. Um, let's yeah. try with Emerson. Emerson, could you please uh, share uh, Pedro's video, please? Yep, Hello. just optimize it. Uh, Emerson, I don't know if it is optimized. I think it is. 
Maria and I will present to you the paper entitled I Study on Global Plus Planners Algorithms for the Simulator Turtlebot 3 Robot in Ross. For the presentation, I organize it as it follows. First, in section 1, I will give a brief introduction about the problem discussed in this study. In section 2, the theoretical background. In section 3, the materials used in the study. In section 4, methodology. In section 5, the results. And finally, in section 6, I will summarize and conclude this presentation. Introduction. So recently, uh, due to the technological advances, it, it is very low here. You can find it in our daily activities. Yes, it's very low here too. We have the video from our system from background. And mobile. This is the background one, I think. Oh. Maybe the video is. With the, uh, the, the the video is very very low the volume yes i, uh, I can i can continue. well i don't know if we, we if you can i think you can present do you have the the slides in there if you can present it's better i try to Can you see the, the slides? Yeah, much better now in here. Yes, yeah, you can hear. Okay. You can you can start, uh, Pedro. Okay. So I present a study uh, entitled "A Study on Global Pet Planners Algorithms for the Simulated Third Robot Three Robot in Ross," and I'm from Federal University of Santa Maria. So, uh, I organized the paper as it follows. First, the introduction, uh, and second, the theoretical background. Section three, uh, the materials used in this study. Section four, methodology. In section five, the results. And finally, in section six, I concluded and summarized this presentation. So, the introduction. Um, uh, since the 90s, uh, the technological advances have allowed the use of the robots to use uh, for daily activities. And these robots are classified in mobile robots and manipulator robots. And the autonomous navigation is an area of mobile robots. There's two techniques that allow robots to move around safely in any given, mind, in any given environment. And one of its main problems is the trajectory planning. So this work aims to perform a comparative study on two techniques that work a solution to the problem of the global trajectory planning, the Dijkstra's algorithm and the A-star algorithm. Uh, a theoretical background about the Dijkstra algorithm. It was devised by the Dutch computer science at Dijkstra and aims to solve the problem of the shortest path. The A-star algorithm uh, can be seen an extension of the Dijkstra. And the main difference between the two is the presence of an heuristic function in the A-star algorithm. So here you can see how it works. Uh, the A-star algorithm uh, goes to the, to the goal more directly. And when he finds an obstacle, he starts to explore his neighbors. And the Dijkstra, in contrast, uh, explore the cells in that waveform. So to hit the target, he needs to explore all the possible nodes. And uh, the A-star algorithm, because of that heuristic function, it requires less computing time. So the materials used, the third robot, 
It's a free hardware personal robot kit, and that feature is open source software. We chosen TurtleBot 3 robot, that's a mobile uh, program on robots. And we did have an, um, a real robot in the university. Uh, the ROS, Robot Operating System, uh, system. It's a flexible structure created with the intention of simplifying the using and coding of your robot software. The simulator used is the gazebo. Uh, here you can see a picture of the TurtleBot 3 burger uh, simulated in gazebo. Uh, the RVs, it's a three-dimensional viewer, and we use it uh, for a representation the data, 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 and the and to set the goal to the robot. The simulation environments use it two simulation environments that we created. Uh, the first one is that you shape it form. It's chosen because usually is a uh, difficult to robot to create a a path. And the second, it's more uh, uh, obstacles in your uh, arrangement of a. I forgot the word, but it's more like the usually environment. So not have a, a specific design. The methodology. So for the experiments, you made 10 tests or proposed for each map. And five of these tests use it Dijkstra's algorithm, and five use it a star algorithm. Um, before to start the tests, we need to have a map of the environment. So to do this, we use the Rust packet called GMapping. Here are some parameters that we use it. Uh, you can see the values. So. The results. So that black line is the path found by the Dax algorithm. And here we can see that uh, was a smooth directory because the Dax algorithm uh, of the ROS libraries used the, gradi the gradient descent method. So he can find that trajectory more smooth and for the two environments. Here in Gazebo, a uh, sequence of images of the experiment using the Dijkstra algorithm, the first map. And here for the second environment using Dijkstra algorithm. The yellow dot is the target. And here with the star algorithm, you can see in your views, and that red line is is limited by the grid. That's because uh, the star algorithm explore less cells, so the gradient descent method uh, don't uh, don't offer better results for this algorithm. Here are a sequence of images of the star algorithm in the first environment. And here for the second environment, using the star algorithm. So uh, the comparison some with these two algorithms, you can note at a slight advantage for the Dijkstra algorithm when compared to the star algorithm. 
And the reason is that the gradient descent method significantly reduced the path length and also reduced the timing to reach the goal. Uh, and the difference in computing time of the algorithms did not have a great influence because the robot movement speed is not so high. So he don't need to uh, fast computing time. So the conclusions, we made uh, simulations on two environments in gazebo and the tests regarding displacement of the robot tree were successful. And the Dijkstra and STAR present good results for the planning of global trajectory planes. And the comparative study of the global planners was done, and we observed that the Dijkstra available in ROS libraries presented a slightly better results when compared to a STAR algorithm in ROS. Some reference. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pedro, for your presentation. Uh, we have questions from YouTube. Anyone from, from the audience here have questions? Uh, one question, Pedro, is, is that if if you applied it in real environment or just simulation from Roselia Aparecida? Um, yes, we made a uh, for future work and for validate the results we made you in the real environment. Uh, you did some real experiments or you, you intend to do that? No, we already did, but uh, we didn't uh, put in the presentation, but it's already made. Uh, okay, and the results are the same? The Why results are the same. Uh, the Dijkstra have a slight advantage, not so big, but the same results are very, uh, very closing. Okay, uh, more questions here? Uh, I have one, Pedro. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you started uh, your presentation showing that the A star algorithm is better than the Dijkstra uh, solution. Uh, and your results show that the Dijkstra is better, performance better than the, the A star algorithm. Do you have an idea why? Uh, yes. Uh, the A star uh, found a and more faster, but not necessarily is more optimal. So for the experiments, we uh, the we measure the time to reach the goal. So with a, a path a less, a, a, a less path, the, the robot can find the target more, more faster but the time for computing that path, that's not so, not, don't, uh, don't have so influence. Okay. The, the robot is a bit slow? Yes, the velocity is uh, 0.22 meters per second. It's not moving so fast. Okay. Uh, in the real experiments, you, you calculated uh, the path online or offline and then executed the, the motion? 17 hours. Uh, the path was calculated by the computer. So it was in uh, TCP IP, which is a network. It's linked to with the robot. So you can... Uh, if the path is calculated in, in real time, you can. I don't understand the question. No, okay, it's it's good, Pedro. Thank. Uh, I have no no more questions. Anyone? 
Okay, thank you very much, Pedro, for your presentation. And we'll go to the next paper. Uh, I think Alice is present to, to present for us. Are you online, Alice? Yes. Yeah? Okay, you will present for us. Ok, conseguem visualizar? Yes, we, we can see. Bom, uh, boa tarde a todos. Uh, peço desculpas por estar apresentando em português, mas o meu inglês não é muito bom. Uh, então, eu me chamo Alice Sou Garcia, eu estou em nome do meu grupo de pesquisa aqui para apresentar o nosso trabalho, uh, que tem como título Monitoramento e Análise de Movimentos Compensatórios do Tronco com Câmara RGBD e Sistema Sem Fio para Reabilitação de Membros Superiores. Tá. Essa apresentação está dividida, então, em introdução, metodologia testes e resultados e algumas uh, conclusões acerca desse trabalho. Uma série de novos programas de, de reabilitação, eles estão sendo estudados e aperfeiçoados já faz algum tempo, como, por exemplo, robótica para reabilitação e reabilitação baseada em jogos. E esses programas, eles têm como objetivo auxiliar o processo de fisioterapia convencional, tornando, então, esse processo fisioterapêutico muito mais atraente, frequente e menos invasivo. Segundo a Sociedade Brasileira de Doenças Cerebrovasculares, o AVC, o Acidente Vascular Cerebral, ele é a doença que mais mata os brasileiros, além de ser a principal causa de incapacidade no mundo. Eu trouxe alguns dados, por exemplo, em torno de 70% das pessoas que sofrem o AVC, eles não retornam ao trabalho. E cerca de 50% dessas pessoas acabam ficando dependentes de outras pessoas na execução de, das tarefas mais básicas do, do dia a dia, como pegar alguma coisa, lavar uma louça, dentre outras. Uma outra questão muito associada a essas pessoas que acabam sofrendo o AVC está no fato delas de compensarem os seus movimentos uh, a partir da utilização de outros membros não afetados. Então, o simples movimento de pegar um copo, de repente a pessoa não estica todo o braço por ter sido um membro afetado, e a, mas sim faz uso da movimentação do tronco para conseguir alcançar esse o alvo dela. Né? E esse tipo de, de compensação acaba prejudicando no processo de, de fisioterapia. Então, uh, considerando os grandes números né, associados ao OVC e com esse monte de uh, abordagens terapêuticas que vêm sendo uh, estudadas para auxiliar no processo de reabilitação, é que o nosso grupo pensou... Uh, em trazer algumas abordagens, alguns estudos, visando essas pessoas, visando tentar auxiliar no processo de reabilitação dessas pessoas pós o, o AVC. Então, as abordagens terapêuticas, elas uh, fazem uso de dispositivos que conseguem fazer uma supervisão uh, melhor durante a prática do, da fisioterapia, uh, obtendo alguns resultados mais satisfatórios no menor Uh, tempo de recuperação. Pensando nisso, então, que esse trabalho ele surge com o objetivo de fazer a detecção e a análise desses movimentos compensatórios do tronco para auxiliar esse processo de reabilitação dos pacientes pós-AVC. Uh, e esse estudo, ele traz uh, duas formas de fazer essa detecção desses movimentos. A primeira, que já está implementada, que faz uso de uma câmera RGBD, o Kinect, que eu vou falar mais adiante, e a segunda, que ainda está em fase de, de desenvolvimento, que faz uso de um sistema wireless. 
Considerando isso, a metodologia eu uh, vou apresentar uh, separadamente dessas duas uh, maneiras de detecção. A primeira, então, que faz essa captura via uh, o sensor Kinect, nós escolhemos o, a segunda versão do Kinect, da Microsoft, porque a segunda versão ele consegue detectar um número maior de, de pontos né, do que a primeira versão, no caso do Xbox 360. Ele conta também com uma biblioteca SDK para Windows que já tem esses pontos previamente capturados, com a finalidade de ser utilizados para jogos, né? mas a gente faz uso dessa, dessa biblioteca para realizar a detecção desses pontos, e aí sim uh, realizamos as modificações e as adaptações necessárias uh, a partir dessa biblioteca para fazer a detecção, então, desses movimentos uh, compensatórios. Uh, essa imagem ela mostra o momento em que a gente está fazendo a captura dessa, dessas informações, então a gente optou por, esse, por uma questão de de ética mesmo, não colocar a imagem da pessoa, mas sim esse, esse boneco que apresenta todos os pontos, né? Então, a gente faz uh, a leitura do, desses pontos, que são do nosso interesse, grava essas informações para posterior uh, análise. Para testar, então, essa primeira uh, fase de, de testes, né? Nós optamos por não estar tá trabalhando diretamente com pessoas com AVC, pegamos voluntários uh, que nem, não tem nenhum tipo de restrição e propomos para ele a execução de quatro movimentos, o de adução horizontal, o de extensão, o de alcance ao alvo e de apontar o alvo. Uh, esses voluntários, eles realizaram uh, os movimentos duas vezes, uma com e outra sem restrição de tronco, eu vou explicar o porquê mais adiante. Então, uh, os dois primeiros movimentos, o de extensão e o de adução, eles são movimentos já utilizados por fisioterapeutas para medição de alcance, tá? Então, são dois movimentos de ombro. Já os outros dois uh, foram movimentos tirados de artigos similares que estudam compensação pra esse, pra, com essa finalidade, né? Compensação de tronco. Uh, que é o de alcance ao alvo na primeira imagem e de apontar o alvo na segunda. Então, simultaneamente a essa implementação da primeira uh, metodologia utilizando o sensor Kinect, foi que se começou a utilizar uma segunda uh, ideia, que é a aquisição dos ângulos das articulações dos membros superiores, né, a partir da distribuição de MUs uh, no corpo do, do paciente. Então, essa metodologia, ela consiste em uma cadeia de dispositivos sem fio, baseada na confiabilidade de comunicação e sincronização das informações obtidas pelos sensores inerciais, pelas EMUs, e cada conjunto, no caso dessas medições de ângulo, vai adquirir as informações através dessa EMU e vai encaminhar, então, para um dispositivo que vai ser o responsável por Uh, unir todas essas uh, informações, todas essas juntas, né? Uh, e a metodologia, ela segue a ideia, como pode ser observada pela figura do mestre escravo, né? Onde a aquisição dos dados das IMUs é a proveniente dos escravos e são monitorados por microcontroladores uh, locais, já são citados os dispositivos na imagem que vão ser uh, utilizados. Então, como resultados e discussões, uh, é importante uh, deixar registrado que os dados eles foram obtidos em parceria com a fisioterapia da Faculdade de, da Anguera, aqui de Rio Grande. Tá? Uh, a ideia foi que a gente tivesse, então, durante a coleta desses dados, o acompanhamento de professores e de estudantes do curso de fisioterapia para análise, né, para ver se os movimentos estavam sendo executados de forma correta e também para dar um feedback do sistema que estava sendo desenvolvido. Então, como eu disse, foram realizados quatro movimentos, os dois primeiros movimentos de ombro, o de adução horizontal, então, o voluntário, ele realiza um movimento angular, permitindo um ângulo de, no máximo, 40 graus a ser alcançado, o de extensão, uh, 
Então, já é um movimento na vertical, que pode chegar até no máximo 45 graus. O de alcance ao alvo voluntário, ele saía de uma posição inicial, pegava um alvo que está localizado à sua frente e retornava à sua posição inicial. Então, um movimento bem comum de ser realizado no dia a dia. Assim como o quarto e último movimento, o movimento de apontar para o alvo, que apontava para um alvo localizado à direita, apontava para um alvo localizado à esquerda e retornava para a sua posição inicial. Apresentando, então, os resultados que a gente tem até o momento, esse é o gráfico do movimento de adução. Como eu disse, os voluntários eles realizaram cada uh, um dos movimentos duas vezes. Tá? Um, eles poderiam utilizar a movimentação uh, livremente. Então, uh, eles fizeram uso, todos eles, uh, da movimentação do tronco, assim como era uh, esperado. A linha tracejada laranja, ela apresenta esse, esse movimento Uh, do tronco uh, sem nenhum tipo de restrição, enquanto a linha contínua azul apresenta o mesmo movimento sendo realizado, porém com uma restrição no tronco, que impedia, então, o paciente de estar tá fazendo o uso do tronco na execução do movimento. A gente pode ver através desse gráfico e através dos outros que sempre que os voluntários eles, uh, não tinham nenhum tipo de restrição, eles, têm, uh, eles utilizavam muito mais a movimentação do tronco, mesmo sem necessidade, porque eram pessoas uh, que não tinham nenhum tipo de, de restrição de, de movimento. Então, aqui só os gráficos uh, que representam os outros uh, movimentos. O último movimento de apontar para o alvo, depois de alguns testes, a gente verificou que não se tinha como realizar ele sem fazer ao menos um pouco o uso do tronco. Então, a gente optou por fazer ele apenas para testar mesmo uh, o sistema que estava sendo uh, desenvolvido. Então, uh, como conclusão, uh, esse estudo ele propôs uh, apresentar o, o trabalho que tem como objetivo detectar e analisar esses movimentos compensatórios, ainda é um trabalho que está em fase de, de desenvolvimento. A gente tem os resultados uh, preliminares utilizando o sensor Kinect. A implementação uh, da segunda metodologia, que faz uso, então, uh, de um sistema wireless, com um as IMUs, está uh, sendo implementada. A ideia é, depois de finalizado, comparar as informações desses dois sistemas para verificar quais apresentam melhores resultados ou até trabalhar com as duas informações em conjunto e, em seguida, uh, avançar, então, para os testes uh, com uh, os pacientes que têm AVC mesmo, mas esses testes eles vão ser realizados depois uh, que essas duas metodologias elas estiverem bem uh, fechadas e se tiver decidido se vai se utilizar uma ou outra ou uh, ambas... Uh, em conjunto, né? Então, uh, essa é a ideia do nosso trabalho. Agradeço uh, a atenção de vocês. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, have questions from YouTube? Ok, e from the audience, we have. Um, one, one question from Julio. Yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Julio from, from UFR. Should I ask in English or in Portuguese? Alice, o Adu prefere? Português, por favor. É, Alice, eu gostei do, do teu trabalho. Eu trabalho também com uma integração com o grupo de fisioterapia. É, a gente usa o Kinetic aqui especialmente para jogos é, projetados especialmente para prática fisioterapêutica. É, eu queria saber como é que foi a tua experiência com o Kinetic 2, porque a gente só usa o 1 aqui. A gente não teve ainda 
contato com o Redic 2, a API ela é paga, como é que foi a integração com, com o ambiente de software de vocês? Uh, é, nós inicialmente nós trabalhávamos com o Kinect 1 também, tá? Uh, só que nós tínhamos uh, a intenção de pegar pontos da mão e o Kinect V1 ele só pega um né, desses pontos. O Kinect V2 ele já consegue pegar um número superior de pontos, por isso nós fizemos a, a migração. Mas tem um outro colega que trabalha com isso, que ele comparou uh, os dados obtidos com o 1 com o 2. E aí, uh, os resultados eles foram um pouco mais uh, satisfatórios, mas não, não teve uma grande di diferença. Mas uh, a API ela não, não é paga, a gente teve acesso, a gente usa o Visual uh, Studio para estar tá, uh, programando e né, fazendo uh, as alterações e para gravar as informações também, tudo de forma uh, gratuita. Uh, Alice, could you, é, pode explicar qual a relação, é, por que, que a gente está fazendo, é, por que, que tá, vocês estão fazendo isso pra, na questão da fisioterapia, onde é que entra o, a parte da trajetória, a compensação de trajetória do robô? Uh, assim, uh, nós temos uh, vários trabalhos uh, em conjunto, podemos dizer assim, a gente tem a primeira parte que é a parte uh, de, capta, de captura dos dados, né, enquanto o paciente está fazendo o processo uh, de fisioterapia. A segunda parte, que é essa apresentada, que é a parte de compensação, então, analisar o movimento uh, sendo executado pelo, pelo paciente. Só que até então, as soluções encontradas para se corrigir essa compensação é justamente a de... Uh, prender, podemos dizer assim, o paciente para ele não fazer uso dessa compensação de tronco. A nossa ideia, então, é uh, a partir uh, das informações da compensação, enviar essas informações uh, para que a gente consiga um planejamento de trajetória, fazer com que o robô realize o um movimento fisioterapêutico na pessoa sem uh, que ela faça essa compensação, ou se fizer, diminua. Então, a gente está trabalhando com a ideia de, de um cubo, por exemplo. Então, o paciente ele teria que sair do centro tá? do, do cubo, ir até um, um vértice, retornar, ir até o outro, retornar para trabalhar com a ideia do, do movimento 3D. Né? Só que a gente sabe que esses pacientes com AVC eles não vão conseguir, uh, ao menos num primeiro momento, realizar aquele cubo perfeito. Eles vão realizar um movimento num cubo uh, meio torto, não tão uh, ideal. Então, a gente uh, manda essas informações para um robô e o robô uh, vai se adaptar àquele paciente tentando fazer com que ele uh, compense menos uh, o movimento e aí, conforme ele for tendo resultados mais satisfatórios, o robô vai se adaptando até que ele consiga realizar né, o movimento do cubo perfeito ou o mais uh, próximo disso possível. Ok, obrigado, Alice. Uh, obrigado pela tua apresentação. Uh, vamos para o nosso último trabalho da, da sessão. Uh, trabalho The Paper is Deaf é, Approach to Enhance Monocular Deaf Estimation. The authors are present. Yes, uh, I'm present. Uh, okay, Raul, thank you very much for your paper. You can, you can start your presentation. Okay, uh, can you hear me well and see me as well? Yes, I can hear you and I can see your, your camera. Okay. Um... Just a minute. Ok. Um, you can see your screen here. Can you see my screen? Yes, and it's ok. Ok, great. Um, so, good afternoon, um, or good evening, actually. My, my name is Raul, and I'm a graduate student 
at the University of Sao Paulo. And today I'm going to present the work Death Completion with Morphological Operations, an intermediate approach to enhance monocular death estimation. And this presentation is divided into the following topics. Introduction, in which the monocular death estimation task will be presented. Afterwards, uh, I will cover the data sets used, as well as the proposed deep network architecture. And also, I'm going to, to talk about the implementation details, the hardware, hardware and algorithm infos, the metrics employed in the evaluation steps, then uh, I will present the qualitative and quantitative results for both death, comp <clears throat> for both death completion and single image death estimation problems. Finally, the conclusions will be clearly listed. And according to the World Health Organization, approximately 1.35 million people die in traffic accidents every year. And with that in mind, perception mechanisms for autonomous vehicles allow to identify navigable surfaces and locate obstacles in order to prevent accidents and navigate safely. In the perception mechanisms, LiDAR, the LiDAR can act, stereo cameras, radar and sonar are the technologies that uh, are capable of extracting depth data from the environment. However, uh, LiDARs are cost prohibitive per unit and perform sparse and noisy depth measurements over long distances. Kinect sensors are sensitive to light and have a lower distance measurement limit when compared to LiDAR. Zero algorithms fail in reflective and low texture regions, and radar and sonar are generally used as auxiliaries. Thus, uh, the use of monocular cameras for the monocular defestimation area is advantages in the context uh, of robotic perception, knowing that uh, they require a smaller installation space, are low cost, and have a lower energy consumption when compared to other sensors. And this image illustrates the autonomous vehicle used by the Kitchen Vision benchmark suit, along with its perception mechanisms that allow the exploration of that depth data from the environment, as can be seen in this short GIF. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to make a brief introduction of the early methods applied to estimate depth. And one of the first techniques used to get depth information from observed scenes leveraged precise and robust techniques of correspondence between points of rectified image pairs, as well as 3D reconstruction algorithms that may recover the three-dimensional layout of the scene. Also, the first works in the field of single-view single depth estimation were based on the use of handcrafted features selected manually to infer geometric relationships in the structure of the scene. These methods uh, use monocular cues such as occlusion scales, perspectives, textures, and artifact locations, and global monocular features such as the shape and configuration of the scene. Graphical models such as the conditional random field were also addressed. And the advances in convolutional neural networks and high performance graph processing units, in addition to the availability of data sets um, built with structured light and lighter sensors, motivated the emergence of new works in the, in the scope of single view depth estimation. And as can be seen in this image, uh, this is one of the fundamental works in the side and deep learning areas, which uses a stacked CNN that receives RGB images and estimates depth, surface normals, and semantic classes. And now, uh, in this slide, considering the recent side approaches that employ deep learning techniques they may subdivide it according to the type of training in supervised, semi-supervised, and self-supervised. However, in this presentation, um, I'm going to focus only on the supervised case, which is related to this work. This type of site approach uses sparse and noisy reference depth maps constructed 
through point clouds from laser scans to train supervised deep CNNs. And as can be seen here, uh, the authors develop a CNN that performs sight and benefits from 3D geometric features of the scene through virtual normals. And this is a recent work that is important for the area of single image depth estimation. Now, in this topic, um, I will present the data sets used in this work. And the KT data set, the KT depth data set is a competitive and public available uh, data set composed of serial RGB images with all their scenes and their respective aligned reference depth data. In this work, we apply the eigen split to train and test our framework with 23,158 and 652 samples respectively. And this short GIF shows the reference point clouds captured by, a lot, by LIDAR laser scans that is used to train side models. And this search GIF uh, was captured by the images made available by the, the Kitchi Vision benchmark. And um, moreover, the Kitchi morphological dataset was built through the application of the closing morphological operation to partially densify the reference maps of the Kitchi depth. The equations below. Uh, it is possible to verify the formulation of the closing expression, which is formed by the expressions of dilation and erosion. The figure represents the behavior of the closing algorithm when applied to a grayscale image. And besides the closing technique, the applied uh, we applied the depth completion method introduced by Van Gunsbeck et al. to produce the kit completed. And this method can be visualized in the figure below. This method is RGB guided and capable of completing sparse and noisy depth maps from LiDAR signals by combining two parallel networks. And this CNN represented by the figure in question was used with the per train weights made available by the authors. And in this first slide of the topic network architecture implementation and metrics, uh, I'm going to introduce the proposed supervised framework and our deep network architecture, as can be seen below. Uh, in such framework, the schematic above represents this sparse uh, depth map densification using the depth completion methods. And below is the monocular depth estimation pipeline. The training of our pipeline is conducted through previously densified reference depth maps. And compared to other state-of-the-art methods in the site literature, ours has compared, uh, comparable accuracy and yet is slighter and faster. As illustrated, uh, our CNN mainly consists of a light feature extraction stage, a denser atro spatial pyramid pooling model, and a decoder stage. Particularly, uh, the deep network structure consists of a decoder with the convolution layers, setting polar convolution and up convolution blocks followed by skip connections with specific, um, specific outputs from the feature extractor. And the feature extractor is represented by the DenseNet one-to-one. Uh, some of the trainable parameters from the encoder and the decoder, the network sums up to 12 million trainable parameters, which is few considering the, the total trainable parameters of recent uh, works that apply deep learning techniques with and produces state-of-the-art results. The table on, oh, I'm sorry. And all right, the table on the left shows the layers that compose the dense net one-to-one, -one, along with the resolution of the input feature maps of each layer. The table on the right uh, shows the layers of the decoder structure, 
in addition to the resolution of the input feature maps of each layer. And now, uh, in this part of the presentation, I'm going to list the hardware and software details to train and to train the tester framework. We use the server with two NVIDIA Titan X GPUs, where both were applied for training and only one for testing. For the software, uh, we use these specifications uh, shown below. And with respect to the loss functions, we use the scale invariant error and the Berhu penalty, whose expressions uh, are shown below as well. And more specifically, the scale invariant error is an efficient function to determine the relationships between the depths of a scene without the influence of its scale. And the whole penalty combines the advantages of the mean absolute and mean squared errors. And as the evaluation metrics, we use the following ones that are widely addressed in, all, in other recent works. And all of those metrics are, expre are expressed in the equations below. And in this topic, I will deal with depth completion and depth estimation results obtained in the ablation studies of our work. And this table of this slide uh, presents a comparison of the implementing data set with respect to the degree of densification. And such comparison is based on the number of valid pixels in the 23,158 training images. Therefore, it is possible to conclude that the key to complete it is the densest data set developed. And through, this, and through this table, we may see that the method introduced by Van Gonsbeck et al. reconstructs the ground truth so that it becomes completely dense, whereas the morphological operator is only partially densified. And however, it is possible to notice that the morphological op closing operator uh, is the technique that least changes the metrics. And the method and the learning based method from Van Gans Beck et al. is the method that most changes the metrics. And now I'm going to focus on the discussion on the side results. And through this table, we may see and also analyze a comparison of our senior results when it is trained with each of the proposed data sets in both loss functions. Our pipeline achieves a better performance when trained with the partially dense data set. This occurs due to the hypothesis that all identification processes can improve the quality of the network predictions Great changes on the ground truth death values caused by the death completion process can negatively influence predictions. And by this slide, we can validate the statements already made, but for a higher death limit of 80 meters. And moreover, the proposed deep learning, uh, the proposed deep matter actually, retrieves more accurate predictions when it is trained with the Berhu penalty. And this slide's table presents a comparison between the accuracy from the proposed CNA when trained with the Kitchen morphological and state-of-the-art state of the art works. Our method does not surpass the best results in the literature, yet it is comparable to them. And furthermore, the developed pipeline has the advantage of being the lightest and the fastest among the worlds considered. And uh, through this slide table, we may confirm the comparisons made earlier for a depth limit of 80 meters. And moreover, it takes some of the morphological operator an average of 0 0.007 seconds to process each depth map on a 4.20 gigahertz CPU which makes the application of the morphological 
technique in the real scenarios possible. And here uh, we may see the qualitative results of the proposed CNN when it is trained with the, with the different data sets. The proposed predictions indicate that when the network is trained with the key morphological, it retrieves high definition depth maps with fewer blurred regions, regions under the sky limit. And by this comparative figure, we can notice that our method is capable of better understand of better estimating actually uh, the depth of finer objects and the geometric structure of the elements that compose the scenes. Also, our results present greater details for both the closest and most distant artifacts from the camera. And um, as the conclusions, we, uh, we introduced a light and fast side pipeline that leverages depth completion methods to improve the accuracy of the predictions. And with the conducted experiments, we demonstrate that uh, the proposed CNN produces better results when trained on the novel key team morphological data set. And these are the foundations that finance this project. And thank you. Thank you very much, Raul, for your presentation. Congratulations for your work. Um, I don't believe uh, Vinicius, is, Vinicius is here anymore. Um, I believe he had a problem, um, ran out of electricity in his house. So I, I'm assuming the, the end of this session. And I'm going to ask um, if anyone has questions. So I can pass it to, to Raul. Questions from the audience, questions from the attendees, questions from the YouTubes. Okay, how, how since uh, no one has questions, I have one, uh, just a quick question. Uh, it's more of a curiosity. Um, do you think that the current state of the art, with the current state of the art, with your work, um, it could be possible to, um, alongside, is, completing a, a depth map, map um, estimating the scale if of a reconstruction using deep learning techniques. Do you think it, it will be possible? To reconstruct what? The scale of? Um, okay, so um, when we take a picture with phones, with a single camera, and um, we know the depth map of that picture, we know the depth method associated with that picture. We know that each pixel has a uh, depth, a depth value. Yes. Yes. So um, in general, when we don't have this, um, the scale information, what are you, what are you, the maximum um, you have is a uh, grayscale picture with relative depth differences. So we, we only have the information that one pixel is closer than others. But we don't have the information that that pixel is five meters while others are 60 meters away. So I'm asking you, do you think it will be possible using deep learning techniques, state of the art or method or others to also estimate this scale? Yes, uh, I guess so. Because our network was trained to, to estimate um, the depth of the pixel, the of the of a grayscale image, uh, actually of our RGB image in uh, a pixel-wise fashion. So we are uh, so our network was trained to estimate the depth of each pixel. However, if our training was if our network was trained um, with also RGB or, or um, grayscale images, whatever, and it it was uh, if it was trained to to estimate the scale between um, between neighboring pixels, I guess it, it would uh, also estimate in the in a similar accuracy of of the depth values. It, the problem is to to generate the data set that could um, that could supply this this type of application. I guess this is the 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 main problem of supervised networks. That uh, we we ought to have this 
this type of uh, ground truth. So we can uh, make our network predict uh, depth values or scales or semantic labels, whatever. And but it is uh, certainly possible. Okay. Thank you, Raul, for your answer. Um, so we have we have time to uh, to close the session with another question. If anyone has one, okay, Raul. Thank you very much for your presentation. Congratulations again for your work. Um, you. Before closing the session, I would like to remind everyone that um, today at nine. At 7 p.m., a musical performance will be broadcasted online through this channel or and also through the YouTube channel. And right after the, the musical performance, we're going to announce um, the best papers of Lars SBR 2020. Okay, everyone. So um, I would like to invite everyone to Discord. Um, there are a lot of audio channels in there, which um, is the closer, I think, that could mimic a um, table when everyone can gather and have a drink, uh, have a snack, each one in their own houses. But um, I think it suffices for now. <laughs> Luis Marcos wants to say something. Uh, just to invite for tomorrow, right, Bruno? Where are we going yes, to um, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, we are going to be having um, um, the plenary talk of Professor Luke Van Gogh. Um, there is going to be another, uh, some technical sessions after, just afterwards. And afternoon, um, more technical sessions. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's just important to highlight who is uh, Luke Van Gogh. Luke Van Gogh is one of the one of the main researchers in computer vision applied to robotics in the world. So it's a very special name that you have the pleasure to to, to have here with us as keynote. So uh, take a look because uh, Luke Van Gogh all the time have nice things to say. Uh, Luke Van Gogh is one of the proposers of the SURF uh, feature description and many, many, many other uh, nice things that he has proposed. So I just highlight, uh, Luis, the, the importance of Luke Van Gogh for computer vision and uh, per robotics perception and uh, take a look because it, it will be a great talk. He's our neighbor here, Natal. Yes, we figure out we're going to talk about this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, talk about that. this tomorrow. So just, it's just a fun fact. But um, he once told us that, um, yeah, you know, he, he, he's close. He's, somehow he's close to not talk. He has a prestige. Yes. <laughs> he, has, he has about uh, 120,000 citations. This is a large number one of the 10 tops of the world. So I think you should be tomorrow here, all of you watching Professor Von Gaal talk. That will be nice. It will be about uh, vehicles, right? About vision in vehicles. He actually is doing a very nice work in two universities there, right, Bruno? So we invite you to be here tomorrow. Okay, so- uh... Thank you. Thank you, Luis Marcos. Thank you, Paulo, for the, all the information. Thanks, everyone, for attending us. Uh, to, to the See you at 9 p.m. in Brazil. <laughs> yes. Bring your Since, wine. Yes. My map. I'm, I'm going to press an orange juice. <laughs> orange juice. Okay. Yes. Freshly pressed orange juice for this session, for the music session. I bring water. <laughs> Okay, so we'll okay. see you soon. Many thanks, thanks to you, Bruno.
É, lá não é robótica não, mas. Mas é próximo, né? Pelo menos. Não é robótica, não. Não, é, é que é mais ou menos. É porque não dá pra fazer robótica com quem não sabe de programar, não sabe fazer não, você tem que saber. É, amor, você vai indo ao capo técnico. Mas ela não é robótica não. Mas ela é aquelas crianças aleatórias. Mas elas aprendem a construir a eletrônica, a programação. Né? Mas ela, é porque ela não vai ficar uma ciência, ela vai ver os robôs, ela vai ter os robôs, ela vai ter os robôs. Mas eles não ficam fazendo o Alice? Sim. Mas eu acho que ela é uma boa educação, você não precisa que eles dão uma entrevista. Assim, Mas não, ela, ela não quer, é porque, ela quer de graça. Ela não quer fazer é porque ela não quer dar, dar é, comercial de graça. É, não, ela nem comercial. Não é interessante você, tipo, qual é a diferença de uma escola que oferece uma coisa para a gente que paga. Ah, nenhuma. Todos falam que tem um aluno diferencial para a gente que paga. Essa aqui ensina francês. Outra ensina inglês. Essa aqui é ensina robótica. Ah, eu escolho isso. Paga ensina robótica. Não, não, não. Isso aí é porque ela não queria robótica. Não, ela queria robótica. Ela queria saber se era de graça. Se era um projeto. Que aí é interessante. Se for uma coisa de graça. Se é uma coisa
Deixa eu ver. Deixa aqui. <risos> Pô, esses esse caras nem, nem pra montar o meu som. Não, pô, mas tá, tá, tá montado aqui. Bem, eu vou, eu vou sair aqui, tô Valeu.